The Ways and Means Committee will now come to order, and good morning to all, and thanks to our witnesses for joining us this morning for this important hearing. We're holding today's hearing in the committee hearing room and via the WebEx platform in compliance with the rules and regulations for remote committee proceedings pursuant to House Resolution 8. Before we begin, I want to remind members of a few procedures to keep these proceedings running smoothly. First, consistent with regulations, the committee will keep microphones of those present on the WebEx platform muted to limit background noise. Members are responsible for unmuting themselves when they seek recognition or when recognized for their questioning. Committee staff will mute members only in the event of an inadvertent background noise. In addition, when members are present in the proceeding via WebEx, they must have their cameras on. If you need to step away to attend another proceeding, please turn your camera and audio off rather than logging out of the platform. And with that, we will turn to today's hearing. Nowhere to Live, Profits, Disinvestment, and American Housing in Crisis. Housing is a basic necessity for every American. It plays a vital role in determining our access to education and jobs, our health and well-being, and financial stability. Just to move off script for a second, I've had a long time interest, particularly in urban housing. There are a few issues that are more complex in American urban life than the issue of housing. We can talk about income elasticity, supply and demand, subsidizing the uh, tenant, subsidizing the landlord, writing down the price of property, tax forgiveness. You can tell my DNA was in local government. But the truth is that uh, it hasn't brought us any nearer to a solution today. And, one issue that I hope we might hear a bit about as well is what local zoning has done to limit the supply of affordable housing. Our families and our communities can't thrive without quality affordable housing. Too many Americans face skyrocketing housing costs, long waiting lists, new pressure from institutional investors, and unprecedented bidding wars that keep them out of the housing market. The pandemic underscored the importance of having a safe place to shelter, raise families, and often to work. But just when our homes became more important than ever, a range of forces converged to drive up prices faster than in recent memory. As we entered the pandemic, there was already a shortage of millions of housing units, and the largest generation of adult Americans, millennials, who were entering their prime years were also looking to form households. When the pandemic disrupted global supply chains to create a perfect storm for American families searching for quality, affordable housing, we all know that the storm continued, especially for families who relied on pandemic housing relief programs that had been wound down in recent months. In 2020, the typical American family spent over a third of their household income on housing, and these costs are rapidly escalating. I recall vividly when there was a time when it was suggested nowhere north of 25 percent. Home prices have risen over 20 percent in this past year, and rents are up by over 15 percent. As these costs rise, it's harder and harder to save for the down payment. With home ownership slipping out of grasp, competition builds up on the rental market, and it becomes an endless cycle. To make matters worse, private equity has also made its way into the housing market. In the first quarter of this year, institutional investors bought up 28 percent of the homes nationwide. How can a family trying to buy a starter home possibly compete with that firm that would be offering cash? They can't, and unless something changes, many families will not become homeowners. This is unacceptable. The growing concentration of investor-owned real estate doesn't affect just buyers. It means more corporate landlords who are more likely to pursue evictions, impose high fees on renters, and fail to perform adequate maintenance. We will hear testimony today that in some areas, one out of five people can be evicted, often minority tenants, which in turn leads to larger investments in gentrification. This housing affordability crisis has deepened the already wide racial wealth and homeownership gaps. Today's racial disparities in housing and wealth grow out of a long legacy of discrimination and unequal access, from redlining to the fact that many black Americans were denied equal access to GI Bill housing benefits. Overheated competition for housing feels hardest on those who already experience the highest barriers, and that's low-income people and communities of color. Building a fairer, more prosperous nation includes meaningful access to quality, affordable housing. We have the tools to address these needs and to turn that tide. Last year, our committee put forward proposals that would cumulatively, cumulatively create nearly one million additional affordable units. 
The Low Income Housing Tax Credit is the single largest federal investment in the supply of affordable housing. The committee proposed an expansion of this program to increase the availability of housing credits and enable the program to do more for the most vulnerable. The Neighborhood Home Investment Act would help people afford homes in low- and middle-income communities and revitalize communities suffering from disinvestment. Both of these programs enjoy bipartisan support and have continually, and I hope I can count on colleagues on both sides to continue that good work. Today, our witnesses will help us better understand what is driving these exorbitant, exorbitant housing prices, their effects on low- and middle-income households, and how we can better deploy policy tools available. I look forward to an important and informative discussion. And with that, let me recognize Mr. Brady for an opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Neal, for holding this hearing and to our witnesses for being here today. As you know, American families and workers are finding that Joe Biden's economy is a very cruel economy. And they just got hit with more bad news. Inflation today is raging at over 9% and getting worse. Working women haven't had it this bad in decades. The dangerous baby uh, formula shortage, rising crime and inflation, and now housing they can barely afford to live in. And just as with crushing gas prices, Democrats in Washington are blaming everyone under the sun for the cruel rise in housing costs. Builders, local investors, developers who make the construction of new homes and neighborhoods a reality. Republicans have held our ground against more inflationary spending and higher taxes that turn into higher prices for consumers. We're blamed too. But the White House and their allies are desperately doing anything they can not to look in the mirror and face the real culprit of higher prices themselves. They run the House, the Senate, and the White House. The American people know exactly who's at fault. And as we know, the inflation crisis is one of their own making. Everyone from the San Francisco Federal Reserve to former top Obama Biden economic advisors have made clear the Democrats' $2 trillion so-called COVID stimulus fueled inflation, worsened the labor shortage, and sabotaged our economic recovery. It hit housing especially hard. By shoveling trillions of federal dollars in the economy, they distorted demand for housing in addition to demand for consumer goods. Now we have too many dollars chasing too few homes. And housing inflation is raging at five times the national average before President Biden took off. And this is a shocking point. The average home price has gone up $100,000 since President Biden took office. The average home price has gone up $100,000 since the President took office. Who can afford that? Back in my home district in Texas, home prices are up another 20% in Walker County, costing families almost $150 more a month from the previous year. And just looking at the price increases, these are hitting the homes on the lower end of the price scale hardest, meaning working families are the ones struggling the most. Add surging mortgage rates due to the White House and the Federal Reserve ignoring inflation and the worker shortage all last year, plus the surge in material prices. Housing affordability is near the low of 15 years ago and again 30 years ago as well. Even those who've opted for a longer commute to try to find a more affordable home are suffering with higher gas prices eating into their budget in a big way. These policies are crushing the American dream for families. And that's top, on top of all the other ways American families are struggling in this cruel economy. New reports show 26 million Americans, many of them low income, have wiped out their savings trying to keep up with prices. An average family has taken a massive pay cut and will spend $5,500 more this year just to buy the same things they did last year. They're skipping meals, eliminating meat, using their credit cards for their daily essentials. This is disheartening. A quarter of Americans report they are now being forced to delay their retirement because they can't make ends meet under Joe Biden's economy. And rather than change course, Democrats in Congress continue to push for tax hikes that hit families, small businesses, home builders, developers, and the skilled trade businesses the hardest. Contrast today with the results in the two years after the Republican tax cuts. Then, low inflation, strong real wage growth, and high housing affordability. Those who received the biggest boosts in wages were the lowest earners, fighting their way up the economic ladder, ensuring they had more money in their pocket, not less, to purchase that home and live the American dream. Under President Trump, paychecks were rising at record levels, especially for people of color, for women, the disabled, and they were going up twice as fast as inflation. Americans were getting a raise every month, not a pay, not a pay cut. 
Today, President Biden turned that around on a dime. They have a pay cut. Mr. Chairman, with this committee marked up the Build Back Better bill, I and my Republican colleagues expressed our deep-seated concerns that the White House was spending so much to kill so many American jobs. We warned under that bill inflation would spin out of control, would raise taxes on the middle class and small businesses. And now we hear rumors of a slimmed-down version of this bill. We still see over a trillion dollars of tax hikes that will drive prices higher. Chairman Neal, we've both seen what this committee can do when we work together and improve the lives of all Americans. I, I believe we can fight for a stronger economy, for less inflation, to lift people out of poverty the right way, but only if we work together. I hope that day comes soon. I appreciate very much your leadership and your willingness to hold this hearing today. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. So, with great pleasure, we want to welcome our witnesses. First, we have Dr. Elora Lee Raymond, Assistant Professor in the School of City and Regional Planning at the College of Design at Georgia Tech. Next, I want to recognize Representative Kildee to introduce our next witness. Mr. Kildee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's my great pleasure to, uh, to welcome uh, Dr. Akila Watkins to this committee. Uh, she is the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Center for Community Progress, an organization uh, that I, along with a couple of other people, founded back in 2009. I served as its first President and Chief Executive Officer and am absolutely thrilled to welcome Dr. Watkins to this committee and for her work, continuing the work that I began um, you know, 13 years ago, working to find ways to revitalize America's vacant, abandoned, underutilized spaces. Her work in this field began at a very young age when she, as a teenager, decided to take this issue on. She has been a thought leader on the subject and will be a great contributor to this conversation. Dr. Watkins, it's great to see you and good to have you here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Uh, next, we have Dr. Christopher Herbert, Managing Director of the Joint Center for Housing Studies at Harvard University. Now let me recognize Representative Horsford to introduce our next witness. Mr. Horsford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm proud to have Audra Hammernick here uh, to testify on the excellent work that Nevada Hand does each and every day. As the state of Nevada's largest affordable housing nonprofit, Nevada Hand is responsible for financing, developing, constructing, and managing some of the highest quality affordable apartment communities in Southern Nevada. Ms. Hammernick joined Nevada Hand as their president and CEO after a 30-year career developing and financing affordable housing across the country. Um, her work at the Illinois Housing Development Authority speaks for itself as she was instrumental in developing over 250,000 units of affordable housing, and she's only served to continue that work in Southern Nevada, as Nevada Hands' 35 affordable apartment communities house over 8,000 residents in over 4,700 individual units of high-quality affordable rental housing. Now, the effects of their work can be felt for years to come, as Nevada Hand specializes in providing their residents with opportunities for education, community engagement, and financial stability. It is a testament to all of the wonderful work that you and the dedicated staff at Nevada Hand accomplish, uh, and I'm really pleased to have uh, Ms. Hammernick here to provide her expertise to the committee. Thank, Thank the you, gentlemen. Let me uh, next introduce to Mr. Edward J. Pinto, Senior Fellow and Director of the American Enterprise Institute in the Housing Center. All of your statements will be made part of the record in their entirety. I would ask that you summarize your testimony in five minutes or less. And to help you with that time, please keep an eye on the timer in front of you, and I will notify you when your time has expired. Dr. Raymond, would you please proceed? Thank you, Chairman Neal, Ranking Member Brady, and members of the committee for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Elora Raymond. I'm an assistant professor at the School of City and Regional Planning at Georgia Tech. Since 2015, I've researched institutional landlords' eviction practices, links to gentrification, and growing market share. In the 15 years since the foreclosure crisis, we've learned a lot about the impact of these firms. Far from being good landlords, they have exceptionally high eviction rates, profit from gentrification, and crowd out home ownership, particularly in low-income communities. The eviction practices of institutional investors threatens households and neighborhood stability. 
In a study in 2015 I conducted while at the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta, my co-authors and I found that institutional investors had an eviction filing rate of 20% in Atlanta. With statistical modeling, we confirmed that this exceedingly high eviction rate was due to the landlord, not other factors. Even with controls for tenant and property characteristic, characteristics, renting from an institutional investor was the biggest predictor of an eviction. Similarly, in Las Vegas, other researchers have found in an analysis spanning from 2013 to 2018 that large investors were six times more likely to file for eviction than smaller landlords. Institutional landlords use eviction courts to boost profits. Firms leverage the threat of an eviction to enhance rent collection or to remove tenants and bring in higher income households paying higher rents. But these profits come at a heavy cost. Steep rent hikes and high eviction rates are devastating for tenants, local schools, and neighborhoods. In addition to displacement through eviction, institutional investors profit from gentrification. In a recent study, I found that neighborhoods in Atlanta with an institutional investor purchase of multifamily housing lost 166 more black residents than adjacent neighborhoods. These purchases led to long-term gentrification of black communities out of Atlanta. Institutional investors also crowd out homeownership. We see this in Atlanta, where homeownership has fallen by 6% since the Great Recession, and researchers attribute a quarter of that decline to institutional investor purchases. Particularly during the pandemic, institutional investors have outbid homeowners and mom and pop landlords trying to buy single family homes. The National Association of Realtors finds that institutional investors were the buyer in 13% of all home sales nationwide last year. That's 28% of all home sales in Texas, 19% of homes sold in Georgia, and 14% of those sold in Nevada. Institutional investors are able to outcompete homeowners at every stage of the home buying process. Many are able to buy with cash, offering a quick, low-risk closing, which sellers prefer. With work crews and the ability to spread risk across a portfolio, these firms can buy as-is or waive inspection, unlike households. Investors have access to cheap debt, whereas moderate income and first-time homebuyers may have lower credit scores and face higher interest rates. Finally, some investors are associated with predatory forms of purchase, aggressively and sometimes duplicitously soliciting homeowners to sell their home even before it is placed on the open market. Institutional investors' ability to outbid would-be homebuyers and charge exceedingly high rents is particularly concerning for racial and ethnic inequality. That is because institutional investors continue to target moderate income, homeowning black neighborhoods. In our study, we looked at the average neighborhood demographics of a home that an institutional investor had purchased, and this was across Tampa, Atlanta, and Miami. We found that the average neighborhood was 84% non-white and 62% owner-occupied. Similar analyses by Redfin and the National Association of Realtors have confirmed that institutional investors disproportionately buy in black communities and communities of color nationwide. The increased market power of institutional investors to affect home prices and set rents is a growing concern. It is problematic if institutional investors have the market power to set sale prices of homes in neighborhoods where they have existing assets that they are using as collateral for financial investments. Homeowners and tenants in Georgia are suffering. The vicissitudes of the pandemic combined with skyrocketing rents, home prices, and high eviction rates is causing extreme housing distress. In the words of a seasoned Georgia community organizer, I have never seen anything like this in my 25 years in South Georgia. We appreciate Congress's attention to these issues. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Dr. Raymond. Dr. Watkins, will you please proceed? Good morning, Chairman Neal, Ranking Member Brady, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on America's housing unaffordability crisis. I serve as president and CEO of the Center for Community Progress a national nonprofit founded in the aftermath of the 2008 housing crisis. We serve American cities, small and large, rural and urban, facing the daunting challenge of systemic vacancy. Every community has some vacant properties. In your district, you're probably thinking of the boarded up home or a vacant overgrown lot you drive by, or a warehouse or factory shut down years or even decades ago. Some vacancy is normal. 
but systemic vacancy is so widespread, it changes the character of a neighborhood. It is a symptom of, a deeper, of deeper issues. Concentrated poverty, economic decline, and market failure, which are often rooted in historically inequitable um, policies. Systemic vacancy is a vicious cycle where vacant or deteriorated properties intensify poor living conditions. This is a wicked problem and it requires intervention. Data show that the US has a shortage of millions of housing units generally, and affordable housing units specifically. There are also approximately 5.7 million vacant homes and likely millions of vacant lots nationwide. We agree new housing must be built, but to address the housing crisis, we must also tap into this inventory of vacant properties responsibly, equitably, and together with community leaders. This strategy is too often overlooked. One key challenge is the appraisal gap. Often the cost to acquire and rehab vacant properties into quality housing exceeds what the house could reasonably sell for. This appraisal gap holds communities back because not even the most dedicated nonprofit housing developers can absorb losses on every project. The small and mid-sized cities we serve have a shortage of quality, safe, affordable homes. And for the few homes that are available, first-time home buyers simply can't compete with cash-in-hand investors. Most markets don't offer mortgage products for the price points in these weak market cities. Without fair and accessible financing, low-cost home ownership opportunities end up becoming permanent market rate rentals in the hands of private equity-backed investors. This phenomenon is particularly acute in predominantly black and Hispanic communities. 74% of white families own a home, compared with 43% of black families and 48% of Hispanic families. And these disparities have persisted over decades. White households possess more than 10 times the wealth of black households, and home equity is a major contributor to this gap. One powerful tool to disrupt these failed systems and markets is a land bank, a public entity with unique powers that is solely focused on converting problem properties into productive use according to local community goals. Land banks can maintain vacant structures tax-free until they can be restored. They can demolish those that can't and identify end users driven by community needs, not outside speculators. They can also turn tax foreclosed properties into quality housing and work with residents to transform vacant land into community spaces. Land banks exist in rural, suburban, and urban places with a total of 250 land banks in 29 states today. As we grapple with how best to increase the supply of quality affordable housing, we must broaden our thinking about how land is owned, stewarded, and developed. We urge lawmakers to pass the National Land Bank Network Act, which was introduced by Representative Kildee and Representative Ferguson. This legislation would provide direct federal investment to educate, build capacity for, and provide technical assistance to land banks and the rural and urban communities that need them. Lawmakers must also address the appraisal gap by enacting the Neighborhood Homes Investment Act led by Representative Brian Higgins and Representative Mike Kelly. This targeted tax credit would close the appraisal gap and provide a powerful incentive for the private sector to build and rehab affordable single family homes. We must invest in these strategies which will equitably build wealth, support home ownership, and close historic and shameful racial gaps. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Watkins. Dr. Herbert, would you please proceed? Good morning, Chairman Neal, Ranking Member Brady, members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to testify at this hearing. I'm Chris Herbert, Managing Director of Harvard's Joint Center for Housing Studies. For over 30 years, my center has published its annual State of the Nation's Housing Report which provides a comprehensive review of trends and drivers of housing market conditions. I'm pleased to share findings from this year's report to illustrate today's housing market conditions, how we got here, the consequences for the nation's families and individuals, and what steps are needed to alleviate the country's worsening housing affordability challenges. 
The headline from our report this year is that record-setting increases in home prices and rents have exacerbated long-standing housing affordability challenges. A major reason for this rapid rise in housing costs is an ongoing shortage of new housing supply, particularly modest-cost housing. Even before the pandemic, new supply was failing to keep pace with rising demand. But the pandemic boosted demand and also drove the inventory of homes for sale and rental vacancy rates to their lowest point in decades. A number of things have contributed to the housing shortage. Regulatory barriers limit the opportunity to develop smaller, denser housing that is both lower cost to build and makes more efficient use of land. Recent supply chain disruptions extended construction timelines and raised the cost of material, further constraining builders' ability to provide these modest cost homes. But swelling demand has been an important driver as well. Even before the pandemic, the large millennial generation had finally begun moving out on their own at rates similar to previous generations, pushing household growth to its highest level since the early 2000s. The shift to work and studying from home and social distancing spurred demand for single family homes in particular. Home buyers also had more purchasing power from curtailed spending during the pandemic and because of historically low interest rates. Finally, sharp growth in investor purchases has further pushed up demand. When this demand came up against tight supply, the result was record-setting price gains. While the rental market softened somewhat in the first year of the pandemic, demand came roaring back this past year, fueled in part by frustrated home buyers creating record gains in rents as well. The result has been worsening housing affordability for both buyers and renters. After reaching record levels a decade ago, the share of households spending an excessive amount of income on housing was inching down through 2019. But the pandemic abruptly reversed this trend as both renters and homeowners experienced a sharp rise in housing costs as of 2020. High home prices and skyrocketing interest rates also pushed homeownership out of reach for millions of renters. From April of 2021 to April 2022, the monthly cost of a median price home increased by 34% raising the income needed to buy from $79,000 to $108,000 and leaving 4 million renters with incomes below this level on the sidelines. The consequences of housing cost burdens for the lowest income households are significant, reducing spending on food and health care and increasing housing instability. The growing obstacles to buy a home also lock millions of renters out of the benefits of homeownership, which can provide both protection from rising housing costs and opportunity to build wealth. These challenges also fall, fall disproportionately on people of color, who experience both higher housing cost burdens and significantly lower home ownership rates relative to white households. Black and Hispanic households experience the largest shortfall in home ownership, with gaps of 29 and 24 percent respectively. For black households, this gap is nearly as large as it was at the time of the Fair Housing Act passed in 1968. These challenges point to two broad categories of solutions. First, there's a clear need for efforts to expand the supply of modestly priced homes, both for sale and for rent, to alleviate the severe housing shortage. But additional supply by itself will not address the affordability challenges for the lowest income households or put home ownership within reach for many moderate income households. Well-designed demand side programs are also needed to assure access to the opportunities to rent and to own good quality homes. Addressing these challenges will take a substantial commitment from the public, private, and nonprofit sectors, but would pay dividends for American families and for society at large. Thank you for turning your attention to these critical issues. Thank you for your invitation to share this information today. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Dr. Herbert. Ms. Hammernick, would you please proceed? Good morning, uh, Chairman Neal, Ranking Member Sorry. Brady, and distinguished members. Uh, no. Excuse me, oh, what's she's on. she's on the remote oh, I'm side. Sorry. We do appreciate your Good enthusiasm, morning. though, Mr. Pento. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you for inviting me to testify today. My name is Audra Hammernick, and I am the president and CEO of Nevada Hand. Nevada Hand is the state of Nevada's largest affordable housing developer. We do construction, financing, development, and management, and we happen to be a non for profit agency. We focus only on affordable multifamily rental. Over the past 29 years, Nevada Hand has constructed 35 apartment communities, all affordable, and we house over 8,000 residents in 4,700 high quality apartment communities. So even before the pandemic, the country was in the grips of a pervasive affordable housing crisis. 
Although the pandemic offered us lessons on how to better support low-income households during the crisis, I'm thrilled that the focus is now shifting from emergency support to sustainable solutions. Affordable housing is affordable because of financing. Affordable housing developers are competing for land, materials, and other costs within the normal market. And rents are the only source of income to pay for normal operating costs like property management, staff, utilities, maintenance, and insurance. The operating costs we pay in affordable housing developments are the same as market rate and luxury multifamily developers. So it's the special financing that makes it possible for us to keep rents affordable for low-income families. And the low-income housing tax credit is our nation's primary tool to create and preserve affordable rental housing. Since its exception in 1986, the credits have financed the development of 3.6 million affordable rental homes in urban, suburban, and rural areas and housed over 8 million low-income households. In 2019 and 2020, LIHTC produced and roughly preserved 130,000 units each year. So that means that no other local, state, or federal program comes close to its level of production. There are two main components that we're following in the LIHTC program. First is households must be low income, and second, household rents must be charged affordably. So most of the residents that we serve at Nevada Hand are in the income range of around $15,000 a year to $45,000 a year in the annual income. Our average rent is around $733 a month, and only 10% of our residents have any type of rental assistance, and typically that is a tenant-based voucher. So I want to discuss the capital investments and community development work through the LIHTC program. LIHTC attracts investors to the affordable housing industry, and it's a true public-private partnership. Many of these investors would not be interested in investing their capital in affordable housing without this great tax credit tool. The tax credit program is also an economic engine for generating jobs, economic activity, and tax revenue. I like the way the National Association of Home Builders gives this simple example. They say when you build 100 affordable apartments, it also generates over 11 million in local income, 2 million in tax revenues, and creates 161 local jobs. Now, in Nevada right now, we have a project going on that's we're building 480 units, both family and seniors. It's a $110 million development cost. 46 million of that is investments into our community by tax credits investors. It's a 20 acre infill site that's set vacant for years. It's creating hundreds of construction jobs. It's creating 15 jobs for Nevada Hand. And by developing a site, we were also able to create three new businesses with at least 45 new employees. So you may ask yourself, why is LIHTC so successful compared to other types of funding sources? Well, I think it really goes back to this public-private partnership. Um, the, the model demands strong oversight by both the investors and the housing finance agencies that allocate the credits by state. The developers need, uh, the investors need developers like me to maintain compliance so they're able to use all of the tax credits. And naturally, they're monitoring like crazy. And the housing finance agencies, they're monitoring for regulatory compliance, but also they're really keeping investor confidence high by making sure that the programs are run properly because they want to keep the tax pricing high as well. So housing credit properties also have high occupancy rates. Right now, they're 97%. And the total foreclosure rate for housing credit type properties is 0.57%, so less than 1%. And that's lower than any real estate asset class. So one other reason that the tax credit program is successful is because it works and it has lots of state flexibility. Thank you so much for letting me speak today. There's lots of gap financing out there like Home Program and National Housing Trust Fund, but the LIHTC program is the primary driver and the backbone of affordable housing development in the United States. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Hammernick. Mr. Pinto, would you please proceed? Good morning, Chairman Neal, Ranking Member Brady, and distinguished members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. For 70 years, Congress has implemented a federal low-income housing policy, which equates high leverage and default, high default risk with making housing more affordable. As a result, homeownership has not been effective as a wealth-building tool for many low-income buyers. Let me be clear. The housing market is becoming less affordable, not because of institutional landlords or other private sector actors, but due to misguided federal policies. 
The real culprit is the massive house price boom fueled by federal housing and monetary policies, which is increasingly crowding out lower income Americans from the housing market. Since 2012, wages have grown by 38%, but entry level homes nationwide have increased by 160%. This price spiral means lower income entry level buyers are increasingly pushed to the sidelines. The solutions are straightforward. First, do not repeat the mistakes of the past. Mistake number one, Congress for 70 years has enacted dozens and dozens of legislative acts involving many trillions of dollars in program expenditures, tax benefits, government guaranteed financing, yet these have not made housing more affordable or sustainable or achieve the generational wealth for many low-income homeowners. The Build Back Better Act would repeat the same mistake by providing $184 billion in new housing-related program expenditures. As a cautionary tale, let's examine the Housing and Community Development Act of 1968, a bill similar in housing scope to Build Back Better. Congress was promised by HUD that in passing the 1968 Act, all substandard housing in the U.S. would be eliminated in 10 years. By 1975, the Act's devastating impact was clear. This book was written in 1973, Cities Destroyed for Cash, the FHA Scandal at HUD, written by a reporter at Detroit Free Press. As the title indicates, in the aftermath of the 1968 Act, neighborhood after neighborhood was ruined as they were, quote, FHA, close quote. Many of these neighborhoods have yet to recover. The second book, Housing Markets and Congressional Goals, was written in 1975 by Ernest Fisher. He noted that the 1968 Act and its uh, goals were unrealistic as a quota of production and were inappropriate and would probably prove as disappointing as had many of the programs presented to and adopted by Congress over the previous two and a half decades. I have a feeling many of the members of this committee have the same feeling about the many programs that have been enacted over the last decades. He observed, very importantly, the inflationary impact of the 1968 Act. From 1967 to 1971, the four years uh, starting with the year before the Act, the index of, of cost of residential construction rose by 33 percent and the average sales price uh, increased by 28 percent. And the core policy failure was expanding leverage so as to make home purchase possible, quote, for lower uh, income prospective purchasers. But in reality, that just brought greater profits and wages to builders, building suppliers, and building labor rather than assisting the people it was intended to assist. In summary, the 1968 Act led to neighborhood ruination, scandal, housing inflation, and government profit seeking, leaving low income households worse off. And I believe Build Back Better would have the same unrealistic and potentially devastating results. Mistake number two, the federal government has a sordid past with respect to zoning. In 1921, the Commerce Department led a national effort to implement exclusionary zoning throughout the country and with policies designed to make newly built housing too expensive for racial and ethnic groups to afford, and we're still living with the consequences of that effort. There's no denying we need more market supply, um, but that should be left to state and local uh, uh, governments to solve and should not be addressed by the federal government. There is a growing consensus that market rate housing will um, uh, be the solution to making housing more affordable, not credit easing or increased government subsidies. My recommendation would be that Congress set a policy goal of reliable generational wealth building for lower income buyers by reducing the long term, the loan term on high risk loans to 20 years. This would require funding low income first time home buyer or lift home tax credit program that I co-developed and many have endorsed. A 20 year mortgage with roughly the same monthly payment as a 30 year loan will grow equity twice as fast, grow wealth and reduce default risk. Thank you and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Pinto. Without objection, each member will be recognized for five minutes to question our distinguished witnesses. Consistent with committee practice in these hybrid settings, we will dispense with the Gibbons rule and will go to, in order of seniority, switching being between majority and minority members. And I begin by recognizing myself. So in Southbridge, Massachusetts on Monday, uh, the Wells School uh, ribbon cutting was celebrated and it involved a low-income housing tax credit, which I have championed. 
In addition to which, uh, there was also a sound investment of the historic tax credit in this initiative. Southbridge is very middle income and seemed to escape a solution for a long time. But all I had to do was see who lived there in Southbridge to know that this was going to work. To see an old school converted for one of the most sound purposes we can think of, affordable housing. And many of the ingredients, I was looking for some perspective on how we could have included new markets as well as an example of success. But my point is that uh, it worked. And it's worked all across New England, particularly in a lot of old mill communities, as we've converted old schools for mixed income housing, and it seems to work pretty well. I, I would use the opportunity, uh, Dr. Herbert, to have you outline the evolution of challenges in our housing market over the last two decades. We've heard that inflation from the American Rescue Plan caused our housing affordability crisis. Would you speak to that issue and what have the consequences been had there been no pandemic aid? Thank you, uh, Mr. Neal. Um, you know, the, the causes of the rise in housing prices, as I said, uh, go back to the fact that even before the pandemic, we weren't building enough housing. There's simply a shortage of housing. Uh, and it was met by a, a surge in demand. But I would say that first and foremost, that demand was pent up demand among millennials who had long delayed moving out of their homes. What the pandemic did is brought home to them the fact that having space to live and work and play was so important. And so it was the pandemic that did induce it, but it was the pandemic that brought home the importance of home. Interest rates certainly played a factor in rising house prices. But the emergency assistance that was provided to renters and home buyers, rather than cause inflation, I think was critically important in maintaining stability in our housing market. It helped not just renters, but it helped landlords. This wasn't uh, funding that went to increase rents, it went to pay back rents to make sure those families stayed safely housed. I would say one of the things we've been surprised about as we watched what's happened in the market is how much eviction rates have yet to come up. The, the effectiveness of emergency rental assistance has been really remarkable in making, keeping people in their homes. And so far, we haven't seen any kind of increase in foreclosures as well. So rather than cause inflation, I think it helps uh, enhance stability. Thank you. Let me do a follow-up question that's not scripted here as well. In Massachusetts, Governor Baker, to his credit, a Republican, has taken on uh, the issue of local zoning laws. And he's been very assertive about it. And he has challenged many high-income communities uh, to do a better job granting variances, special permitting, as well as local zoning laws. Do you have any thoughts on that, Doctor? Uh, yes, so there's a new law, housing choice law, that requires communities served by the mass transit system in the Boston area, some 175 towns, that they have to have a minimum of 50 acres, 50 acres zoned for multifamily housing as of right. And of those 175 towns, very few have any land that's now zoned as of right. All this requires is for the towns to say, these are the areas in our town that are accessible, that can support density, and that will allow that density to happen. It would add a tremendous amount of housing well located and spread throughout the Boston metropolitan area. Uh, I think that it is uh, a really important innovation to, for the state to mandate that local governments make place for the kind of housing that's needed to serve the residents of the area. And I, it's early in its, its stages, but I think it, it will prove to be a very effective lesson. But, but for seven years, Governor Baker has taken this issue on. Uh, uh, Governor Baker has been tireless in promoting, not on, only in terms of what I'm describing here, in terms of mandating multifamily zoning, but changing local laws so that you don't need a two-thirds majority to pass as an override of zoning, but only a simple majority. And they're simple changes, but I think they'll be very effective. He's been a very staunch advocate for these, these measures. Uh, Dr. Watkins, you note that housing affordability and the crisis that has been caused does great harm to communities that have been neglected for a long period of time. Several months ago, the committee held a hearing to examine how generations of systemic underinvestment and discrimination directly tie to racial inequity. To most Americans, home ownership is the primary means of building wealth, financial security, and oftentimes retirement. But you know that many communities that struggle with weak housing markets have a shortage of quality homes because the cost to acquire and rehabilitate those homes in many areas often exceed what the house will sell for. That, I would just point out, contributes to the complexity of the challenges in housing. Would you care to comment on that? Yes, thank you for the thoughtful question, Chairman. Um, absolutely, this becomes a huge issue in our small and mid-sized uh, communities that so many of us uh, care about, is that the equity is simply not there um, in many of these communities. And so for homeowners, 
you know, for, for many of them, they're not incentivized to, to get that new roof, right? Or to do those much needed up, upgrades. Because a lot of the housing that we're talking about in a lot of our small and mid-sized cities are pre-war. And so when we think about the sort of weather-related issues that happen in states like, great states like Michigan and Ohio, um, that actually does a lot of damage to property um, in these respective communities. And so uh, what we are um, advocating for at the Center for Community Progress is the Neighborhood Homes Investment Act, which is um, a piece of legislation right now um, that um, is you know, being championed bipartisan um, that would help produce and develop a tax credit for developers um, to help homeowners, both that are owner-occupied and non-owner-occupied, be able to deal with the equity gap that exists in so many of the communities in which we work in. So we have found out that to put a new roof on that house that's so desperately needed, it costs the same um, in a Toledo, Ohio, as it does in a New York City um, of an equal size house. And so how do we really uh, take into account the sort of difference in um, appraisal that the house in Toledo will have and how, we're, and how we're proposing doing that is through the Neighborhood Homes Investment Act. And so I really urge um, Congress to take this bill up and vote um, and approve this bill because this will be a huge relief for homeowners that decided to stay in place, make deep investments in their communities for the long haul. So I really appre appreciate the question, um, Chairman. Thank it's a you. very and important one. Thank you. Let me ask uh, uh, Ms. Hammernick, you, in the Build Back Better Act, amongst the many things that we wanted to do was to expand the low-income housing tax credit. It was estimated at the time that affordable rental units could be increased by 800,000 over the next decade. Do you want to just briefly discuss the low-income housing tax credit and how it's critical to attracting capital for low for affordable housing, especially for those who most need it? Sure. You know, the the tax credit program is so special because we have investors um, that may typically not be interested in affordable housing. Um, providing capital up front, 10 years worth of capital on day one that ends up in this capital stack that helps us build the buildings. Um, without the tax credit, I'm not so sure they would be interested and we certainly couldn't find um, similar capital that would be debt free because this is real equity into a project. We can find capital if, um, if we wanna pay debt, but debt free capital is pretty special. So it, it's, it's absolutely critical um, to affordable housing development to have the tax credits to find those type of investors. Thank you. With that, let me recognize Mr. Brady to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to each of the witnesses. And, and I agree, in this very cruel economy, it is low-income families and people of color who are getting hurt the most. And we should never accept a home ownership level lower uh, for any uh, demographics in America. And the trick is to find the way to do it. I, I don't think these massive uh, increases in housing uh, is going to help that. Um, I ran into a couple, of last uh, August, uh, just ahead of school, ran into a couple of teachers outside of Lowe's, and they had sold their house for a pretty good price, and they had bought some land, were trying to build a home up in Huntsville, but the cost of that home had already uh, increased by 30%, literally couldn't, couldn't afford to, to, to build a home. And, of course, there were no other rental homes, and so they were scrambling. They just rented a house sight unseen at a dramatically higher rental cost. So here they were without the original home, couldn't afford to build a, the, the one they wanted, uh, now in a higher rental uh, house, unsatisfactory to themselves, but in their school district. That's happening all across America, and, and it's unacceptable. So, Mr. Pinto, so we've seen inflation raging, obviously, across the country, but in the housing, you know, inflation on housing is up five times higher, five times higher than the average in the five years before President Biden. That translates into just in a year and a half an extra $100,000 on the median home price, which I don't know how anyone can afford that. So my question to you, you've looked at the data. When did housing inflation really take off? Thank you for that question, Mr. Brady. Uh, 
Housing inflation uh, started uh, in 2012. We identified a house price boom uh, that was being promoted by federal policies in already in 2013. Uh, but in 2020, when the uh, Fed introduced both zero interest rate policy and greatly expanded its uh, quantitative easing uh, to buy trillions and trillions of dollars of mortgage-backed securities, uh, house price inflation just took off. And in the month of May, uh, our index showed a house price, year-over-year -year house price inflation of 20 percent, uh, excuse me, of 17 percent, and that's the highest uh, that our index has, has shown. Um, and so we attribute much of this to the action of the Fed. We also attribute some of it to um, the action of the Fed, which then uh, drove the stock market up, which creates a wealth effect, and the Fed operates through this wealth effect, and that wealth effect then drove inflation. Uh, and so you also had all the spending that Congress is doing that also drove inflation. Uh, we track credit card spending uh, by income category, and we found that in 2020, credit card spending was up massively among low-income uh, individuals and high-income, and later high-income individuals. Uh, the Congress was providing so much money that they actually were spending much more than they had been spending the previous year. Um, and eventually, the wealth effect that the Fed was so interested in generating with a higher stock market and higher house prices, that was part of their plan. It succeeded beyond their wildest imaginations, and now they're having to take the steps they're taking because we have inflation at 9.1%. Thank you, Mr. Pindon. I, I do want to say, I have a, I, my districts have changed over the years, but always include suburban communities, very fast growth uh, communities, and a number of rural communities. Right now, back home, our suburban communities, and I think across America, are battling an alarming push from Congress to force incorporated cities to abandon local zoning laws and encourage single-family homes. So in this, what's called the war on the suburbs, we worry Washington, D.C. planners are demanding dense urban living, fewer homes and yards, replacing them with more apartments and multifamily housing. To be fair, you know, that, that may be a solution in large cities that are facing severe homeless uh, housing shortages and homelessness. That needs to be addressed. But this type of mandate, one size fits all across the country, would be disastrous for the community you ought to live in the woodlands. Uh, in other communities where we have worked hard to get to develop a balanced approach of affordable homes, townhomes, apartments for singles, for workers, for families and seniors that work beautifully for our community. I, I want to make sure uh, local communities can continue to zone properly for their challenges and their future um, instead of a one-size-fits-all approach. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Thompson, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding uh, this important hearing. And I want to commend all the witnesses, uh, not only for your testimony, but the unanimity uh, that I've seen today. I think every one of you have spoken about the importance of home ownership and how it's uh, more than just about a roof over your head. So uh, thank you for, uh, for agreeing, at least on that point. Uh, Ms. Hamrick, I have a question uh, for, for you. Uh, the the low-income housing tax credit I've seen in my district work extremely well. Uh, I have a district that was hit very, very hard by wildfires over the course of the last five or six years. We lost a lot of housing. And uh, much of that housing uh, was where people who worked in our communities lived. And we're, we're already, I'm in an area that, that's, that's uh, housing challenged uh, without fires. And uh, we have people commuting an hour, two hours a day to work, which uh, creates a whole list of other uh, problems. But uh, I've seen the low-income uh, housing tax credit work well. Uh, we were able to get uh, a special carve-out uh, for uh, areas hit by disasters. And we have built literally hundreds of units of homes uh, to provide a place for uh, people to live. Um, I'd like to know from you, what else can we do to help uh, 
in regard to the low-income housing tax credit and uh, organizations such as yours be able to uh, build more units? It's pretty simple. We mean we need more tax credits. Um, right now in uh, my home state of Nevada, just the, just the way the program works, I'm able to do one 9% project a year. Um, if we have more tax credits, I think the state would allow um, developers to do more deals or would allow us to have more credits. And there's no shortage of need and there's certainly no shortage of um, investors willing to um, um, participate in the program. So to me, it's just simply more tax credits. And, and how about uh, availability of workers and supplies to build these units? Uh, are you seeing a problem there? Yeah, you know, our, our labor has been laggy, but it's been, it's been working. We, we've been slightly delayed, but not terribly. And um, supplies have been slower. There's no doubt about it, but we're still, uh, we have 700 units under construction right now, an additional 200 under rehab. And uh, although it's been slightly delayed, we are getting what we need. It's just taking a little bit longer. Uh, Mr. Herbert, can you speak to that? Uh, I, I just I talked to a constituent the other day who's in the construction business, and they've got a three to six month delay on be able on on their ability to pour uh, cement for foundations because of an additive that comes. I, I believe it was from China uh, that they they just can't get because of the supply chain uh, disruptions and because of the pandemic. Uh, are you seeing uh, any evidence of that? Oh, absolutely. You know, one of the, the, the key metrics of that, I would say, is if you look at the number of homes under construction now, it's the highest ever. And it's not because we're building so many homes that are coming out the pipeline. It's because it's taking so long to build single-family and multifamily homes. So those timelines have been expended, extended. We're, where the people are waiting for doors. They're waiting for materials. And they're, as you say, they're waiting for various additives. Labor has long been a challenge. You know, we, my center is associated with a number of companies and the, the drumbeat over the last 10 years or we don't have enough workers has, has certainly been a, an issue as well and that, that extends the timeline. So uh, supply chain issues from the pandemic certainly are evident in those long timelines for construction. The labor shortage is something that's been much longer lasting and something that really needs to be addressed. And is there anything we can do to uh, expedite the availability of either supplies or labor? On the labor front, there's certainly ways in which we could do to support the, the workforce. There's a number of uh, ways to promote and provide training and to expand the pool of people who go into the construction field. Right now, it's overwhelmingly male, and we need to expand the, the range of people. More, We need more women on the job. Um, and certainly, a key way in which uh, the construction sector has met its need for labor going back 20 years. We built 2 million homes a year in the early 2000s, and a lot of that was through immigration. And so I think immigration reform that would allow us to expand the pool of workers we have for these places where we can't find enough workers would be another area we should look. Thank you very much. I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Smith, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to our witnesses. Uh, this is certainly an important hearing. Uh, uh, the general topic of, of the affordability of housing. Uh, I will say that representing one of the most rural districts in America, we've had these challenges even before COVID. And it, it's um, a very, very frustrating to see what the government response has been and actually how much worse it is here in the last year and a half. I think uh, talking about worker shortages, yes. Uh, talking about the energy crisis and all of these things that are, that are triggering the supply chain crisis. And uh, we have a list here of the cost of fuel oil going up 98.5% over the last year, gasoline 60%, and a list of, of several other items, if you can find them at any price. Uh, the fact that the uh, new inflation rate says 9.1%, uh, actually that seems rather modest compared to what the actual feelings are for workers trying to fill their gas tank to get to work. And I realize that some folks have the options of, of mass transit. Not everyone does. Let me emphasize that. And, uh, and I think that a, a one-size-fits-all approach out of Washington or throwing more money at it, more taxpayer dollars at uh, these challenges, I, I think could very well trigger even more inflation. And I hope we can avoid that. I, I do uh, commend many innovators. I do have a a constituent business, a Renke Manufacturing in Deschler, Nebraska. They actually recently bought a local motel to transition that into temporary housing for their welders. 
uh, to, not to mention other workers, uh, to move to the community, a very rural community, so that they can begin work uh, producing items that are hard to get these days. And I, I think that um, when you look at the building materials, cost of concrete, that's energy driven. And I realize that a lot of uh, the energy costs, the, the high energy costs, are the results of bad policies here in Washington. And uh, I think it's, it's very hurtful to folks who can afford it the least uh, across our economy. We've heard about uh, here in the discussion today, passing reference to available capital, uh, whether it's the occupants of housing, uh, whether it's developers, uh, whether it's um, uh, tax incentives, uh, but boil it down to available capital, and, and I think there's a lot more we could do to discuss uh, issues such as that. But I, I think we need to be very careful about using even more taxpayer dollars uh, to, to attempt to address this when it, can, it will likely do more damage uh, than, than help the, the actual problem. And we, we are now looking at uh, tax hike proposals over there in the Senate. Uh, there's this 3.8% uh, uh, surtax on small businesses and farms and ranches that the Senate is considering. I think that would be disastrous. That would be the opposite thing we ought to do if we uh, want to uh, see more affordable housing among other products in our economy. and uh, uh, and look at available capital that can do far more uh, to address the problems. We need to fix uh, EBITDA uh, to ensure the interest expense on home construction is, is fully deductible. And uh, obviously we need to get folks back to work. I was seeing numbers on uh, the number of folks uh, who have not returned to work since the 2008 crisis. And I think we need to be mindful of that. I, I salute uh, folks like the Arizona Home Builders Association uh, who has a, a program, we had a hearing about this when I chaired the Human Resources Subcommittee, uh, that uh, they, they stood up a training program in the prison system for workers uh, in the building trades. And uh, we had a great bipartisan hearing, a hearing from uh, former uh, inmates themselves who have, who have benefited. And so, uh, actually these, these workers, uh, let me elaborate, uh, they had multiple job offers uh, and, and increasing wages right, uh, right after they were released from prison once they got into that job position, though. I know that the Associated General Contractors in my district, uh, they are major funders of a heavy equipment uh, program at a community college in Hastings, Nebraska. Uh, the students uh, come out of that program with multiple and substantial job offers, I might add, and that is a collaborative approach that I think has been uh, especially productive. Very briefly, Mr. Pinto, could you, you know, you've had a very comprehensive view of the housing market. Could you discuss what the impact of tax increases and worker shortages would be on actual home prices? Thank you for that uh, question. Uh, you mentioned the possible expansion of the net investment uh, income tax to net business income. Anything that increases marginal tax rates including these stealth provisions that are sort of hidden and then they spring on top of other marginal tax rates are counterproductive. And they're doubly counterproductive when applied to small business owners, uh, a key driver of economic growth and jobs. But this would hit new construction particularly hard. 63% of all home builders and two out of three specialty trade uh, contractors generate less than a million dollars a year in total business receipts, according to the NH NAHB. So this would just really decimate um, the housing industry, and it doesn't need that, given um, we need more supply, not less. Thank you. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Larson, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for this uh, important Mike. and insightful hearing. Let me echo uh, your remarks, Mr. Chairman, and uh, my district in Connecticut, we have uh, successfully worked with the tax, historic tax credit that this committee specifically has worked on and uh, have been able to provide for uh, Clover Gardens in, in my district uh, housing uh, for units uh, that address uh, family concerns, including people with disabilities in a historic tax area and what they've done is simply remarkable. And because of that, uh, now more than uh, 100 families have a roof over their head and shelter and uh, the opportunity to pursue the American dream. 
I guess, um, you know, a lot of us believe that uh, government does have a role in helping people out. But a couple of questions I want to throw out. Um, uh, Mr. Pinto, do, do you believe that Joe Biden caused the global pandemic? I don't, I don't think so. No, neither do we. But uh, did the global uh, pandemic, uh, as it ensued, create enormous problems um, internationally and here at home, especially with the supply chain issues that you raised? I don't believe the supply chain issues in the housing area were the main cause. I think it was the inflationary pressures that developed through Fed action and so you're other, saying that uh, the pandemic the had no in, the pandemic had no impact it, on inflation. It minimal. Minimal. <laughs> yeah. All right. So now I also wanted to uh, uh, ask you as uh, as well that because uh, you said in your remarks that. Uh, these uh, investors that are buying up, that they bear no responsibility at all in terms of, of what's going on in the housing industry, that investment bankers buying up these housing and turning and flipping it, now, that has no impact on inflation? I just want to be clear. I think uh, focusing on that takes uh, the eye off of the real culprit here. I would focus on the low-income housing tax credit and all of the people involved well, in that. That's not the question I asked you. The I, question I'm answering I asked question. you was, I'm do you think question. that they have any responsibility with regard to that? I don't believe it's fruitful to focus on that, and you need okay. to focus on other I, I areas that have much more impact. I guess the answer is no. Mrs. Raymond, uh, how can uh, this committee begin to address the rise of institutional investors and private equity purchasing properties uh, that are jacking up rents and artificially creating difficult conditions for low and middle income people to purchase homes? Thank you so much for your question. Uh, I think there's a couple of actions that Congress should take. First of all, I think we need to think about the fact that these firms are closely tied to secondary financial markets. We talk a lot about supply and demand in the primary housing market, but we need to think about um, the, the pressures for demand that are being created uh, in secondary markets and also the way in which these firms um, use these homes as collateral. Um, ideally, you wouldn't have firms being able to appraise a home um, at a value that's far higher than what a homeowner could pay. Um, so you don't want to see a divergence between the appraisal for homes that homeowners pay and for, um, for homes that are purchased by institutional investors. It's very difficult to uh, understand market share. So we have individual reports of exceedingly high market shares that these firms have in certain submarkets. But because we lack rental property registries, it takes somebody with a PhD to put the, t the data sets together to identify who these firms are. It makes it really hard for people to talk to their landlord, for cities to negotiate with large landowners in their cities, and also for regulators to understand, do these firms have the ability to set rice, um, prices and set rents? And I think also the, the use of eviction um, to threaten people that if they don't pay these increasing late fees or if they don't pay these increasing rents or if they don't pay these hidden fees, they'll get evicted is part of why we see these very aggressive rental increases. So funding tenant defense, thinking about ways to um, empower tenants and level the playing field between these global financial players and, and households is another important component of what we should be looking at at the federal level. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Raymond. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Kelly, to inquire. Thank you, Chairman. And thank you all for being here. I think that all of us probably agree on the need for housing for everybody. The question is who pays for it? Uh, this is a marvelous committee. We did something called the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. And in that was something called the Opportunity Zone. And what was the Opportunity Zone designed to, to entice? Or who was it we were attracting? people to invest in properties that most people just wouldn't invest in anymore. I happen to represent a zip code in, in my district, 16501 in Erie, Pennsylvania, which is the lowest income for families. It's, it's horrible to think in that city with everything it has going for it, what that would be centered. Now, unfortunately, unfortunately, we always go after the people who are investing. I, I don't know of programs in this committee where we don't ins 
use incentives of telling people, why don't you use your money to invest in something that would improve whatever it is we're, we're aiming at that day and say, so we want private dollars to go in. I, I really have an objection to uh, us always saying, well, the government just has to have a bigger role. The government just has to have a bigger role. Our bigger role is, is making sure that people still have uh, money to left over uh, after they're taxed. Uh, so while we talk about this, Mr. Pino, I was really interested in what you said. Now, first of all, when, when we say, well, where, where did this inflation come from? Uh, the, the result of where we are right now, and I, I was looking through some, some figures here. Uh, just in the last, uh, in the, the pandemic, building materials have gone up 33%. Would that have any effect on the final cost of housing? It has a, an effect on the cost of housing, but new construction housing ends up really being set by existing house prices because about 90% of all home sales are existing. So you're saying it's, bar, it's based on market? It's based on market, and so uh, prices, if prices of existing homes are going up rapidly, then the price of new homes can also go up. Yeah. And, if, and you could absorb uh, some of these extra costs, but the new homes are going up much more rapidly than just those construction costs. Why? Because of the inflation in the entire market, which is 90% existing homes. Yeah, so I think, this, I think I read somewhere where the inflation is defined by more dollars chasing fewer products. Uh, so what we're looking at is uh, we've, we have printed so much money the last couple of years, I think it's incredible the amount, the fact that we have any ink or paper left is incredible to me that we can still be, be adding, adding more fuel to the fire by doing this. But the real question comes down today, so how do you get to affordable housing? And then once people get into their housing, whether it's, uh, you know, whether it's a rental unit or whatever they are, the fact that they can keep that for some amount of time Banks don't usually lend money unless they think they're going to get it back with interest. What other, what other programs could we put in place that would encourage home ownership and home investment? I mean, all of you can weigh in on this, and, and Mr. Or Dr. Watkins, thank you so much for talking about Mr. Higgins' piece and our, our, my piece on, on the Neighborhood Homes Investment Act, because everything we talk about where we see growth is when the government gets out of the way and lets private investors actually do what they do best, and that's picking good investments to invest their money in. They get a return on that investment, and they take that money, and they put it into something else, which causes more growth. I think when we start thinking about pro-growth as opposed to any other thing, we, we should be looking to policies like that. So if any of you can give us some ideas of what would you do if you were in our position, what, what policies would you put in place that would help with home ownership? Well, thank you very much for that question, and it's one that we think about very thoughtfully at the Center for Community Progress. So there are a couple of things I would uh, want to introduce. One is that we want strategic intervention. Um, so land banks is something that I talked about. Land, and, and for you, Congressman, in Erie, Pennsylvania, you know all too often um, the disinvestment, the loss of population, but still the need for adequate housing in your region. And so one of the strategies we're putting forth is, the um, is to invest in land banks. And the conversion of these vacant properties, properties that people no longer want, how do we convert those properties into affordable housing? And so one of the challenges and something that we're taking on at the center is that there isn't a lot of mortgage products for um, individual families that would want to buy a home for $50,000, right? So this is actually where we've seen um, almost like there is no sort of mortgager willing to take that sort of 30-year um issue on. And so we are really pushing for a small balance of mortgage products at the financial institutional level. Because what happens in lieu of actually having mortgage products that can actually amortize a 30-year mortgage for a low and working class family, then we have private investors that come in and buy these properties literally by the tranche. Okay, and so we don't want that. We want to put families in homes. We want people that want to make long-term, deep commitments to communities. And so what we are advocating for is to develop, um, develop a small um, balance principal mortgage product where families can actually get a mortgage to be able to buy homes that land banks own and be able to stay in those homes, live in those homes, invest in those communities. 
And so that is one of the things that we're advocating for, in addition to the National Land Bank Network um, Act and in addition to the Neighborhood Homes Investment Act. All of these are products that would help service small and mid-sized, low-income, and middle-class families. Thank the witness and the gentleman Thank you. for the inquiry. Let me recognize the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you for this hearing. Uh, this committee has been involved with a whole series of things over the years dealing with problems of housing. Uh, the work that we did in the aftermath of the pandemic to help stabilize and move forward. Uh, as Dr. Herbert mentioned, there, we were looking at potential near collapse, and the outcome had been much more positive than we anticipated. Um, I spent a summer doing research in my own community about housing. I worked with advocates, developers, people who've been involved with these programs to look at the problems and what the federal government should be doing with housing. I feel that I've been pretty knowledgeable. I've worked in this stage as Portland's Commissioner of Public Works. I've been involved with housing. Uh, I was shocked at the extent to which there were market failures, systematic racism in my community, and to Mr. Pinto's notion, just get out of the way and let the private sector do it, the worst discrimination in my community was from the private sector, from the realtors, from the banks, redlining, uh, this undercutting the ability of low-income, particularly minority people, to be a part of this. A veteran returning from World War II in my community couldn't buy a home, even if they were financially qualified. And these things have continued. I would urge my colleagues to do this experiment in your community. Bring your advocates together, look at the history, look at what's worked and hasn't done, and I think it might be eye-opening. It certainly was for me, even though I'd been working in this for a number of areas. And it absolutely is not the case for government to stand back and get out of the way. There are market failures because the people who need housing the most, the market fails them. What, we, what Ms. Raymond talked about in terms of institutional investors moving in and buying huge amounts of the inventory and taking it out of the affordable housing market, um, this is real. It is a market failure. I, I believe in the private sector, and Dr. Herbert, I've enjoyed working with your colleagues over the years to understand what we should be doing in terms of land use planning, in terms of zoning. That's one of the big failures. The local governments have failed to make it legal to build housing in vast swaths of America. Millions and millions of acres, it's illegal to build housing other than large lot, single family homes. And that is not going to get us where we need to go. So we're doing that in Oregon. We've changed the zoning to not allow people to lock up, make it illegal to have uh, ADUs or multi uh, housing units in areas that it would work. But there's far more that I think we all can be involved with. I would hope that we deal with areas of apprenticeship. I have been stunned about the change that's taken place. Building trades historically have been resistant, at least in my community and what I look ar around the country uh, with the building trades, with the carpentry. They're eager to get young women in the process. They're open to minorities, immigrants. And this is part of the solution as well. I don't think that it is important to, uh, to not recognize the problems that the government itself has done for a century, denying opportunities, for example, for uh, integrated housing, for veterans, for uh, the shipyards. Uh, and these re continue to this day. Um, so I say, I, I think there is definitely a role for the federal government dealing with people with low or no income, opening up the barriers, enforcing our fair housing requirements, because housing discrimination continues, and you can document that in your community. This isn't magic, uh, but I do think that there are enough things in the inventory that any of us 
can work on, to find market-based solutions, land banking. I mean, the list of tools is extensive. And a number of our colleagues have more legislation that would move in that direction. And so I hope we would focus on those things that we feel comfortable with and get behind them. Because there's enough for all of us to do to solve what is a, a crisis in every state in the union against our most vulnerable populations. Thank you, and I, I guess I don't have anything to yield back. Ditto. Many members here try. Uh, let me recognize the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Smith, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, today, inflation is at a 40-year high. Ronnie. Since uh, rising to 13.8% since Joe Biden took the oath of office, and the Congressional Budget Office predicts that it will only get worse. The first month, February of 21, when Joe Biden was president, his first month, inflation was 1.7%. And that was towards the end of the pandemic. And it's gone up 13.8% under his policies. As a result, in the first quarter, of 2022, our GDP decreased by 1.5%, and the Atlantic Federal Reserve predicts the trend will continue into the second quarter, with GDP expected to decrease by 1.2%. This was worse than expected and the weakest report since the pandemic recovery began. Yet last week, a spokesperson for President Biden said that the economy is stronger than ever. By, by stating this clear untruth, the administration is trying to cover up the fact that Biden's reckless policies, his reckless spending, are the reason that we are in this mess. The $2 trillion Biden bailout bill that was signed into the law just over a year ago, what did that money go towards? $780 plus million dollars to checks to prisoners? $17 million for a golf course in Florida? $4 million for a parking lot at a beach in South Carolina? Or $2 million to plant trees in Syracuse, New York? That is why every American is paying more to put food on their table and clothes on their backs. Those are the policies of the Biden administration. And that is what the American people are paying for by the results of this reckless economy. But the American people, they're not fooled. All they have to do is check their pocketbooks or their gas pump to see the real truth. Never would I have imagined paying more than $150 to fill up my F-150. And now we are going to sit here and act surprised that we're having housing issues? Of course we are. It's the policies of this administration. These problems, while they will take time to fix, are solvable. But unfortunately, my friends on the other side of the aisle, they're, they're not looking to fix these issues. Instead, they're proposing hundreds, hundreds of billions of dollars of more spending and a trillion dollar tax hike, a trillion dollar tax hike on businesses and farmers and families, which is truly astonishing. And we know for a fact that this will hit working families making less than $400,000 a year. Because just this week, JCT confirmed, confirmed it. If Democrats continue to blindly follow these policies and this agenda, the American dream will fall apart. In recent polling, on average, 75% of Americans believe that our country is on the wrong track. I couldn't agree more. I was recently in touch with a local business owner in Farmington, Missouri, who shared with me some honest and shocking realities of today's housing market in rural America. Today in southern Missouri, to build a house, it costs 37% more per square foot compared to 2020. Meanwhile, delivery times are up to 8 to 12 weeks compared to two to three weeks in 2020, and gas surcharges, which never existed before, are now $150 per delivery. 
If you're doing the math with me, in 2020, a 2,000 2000 square foot home in St. Francis County would have cost $270,000. That same house will cost hardworking Americans $370,000 today. Mr. Pinto, the reality I just outlined is startling. Is this a line that, that what you are hearing uh, are the housing pressures facing rural America? Thank you for that question, uh, Representative. Uh, rural America is facing the exact same uh, housing challenges in terms of uh, house price inflation and inflation generally that the rest of the country uh, is uh, facing. We looked at uh, the median price of uh, a home sold in uh, rural areas versus metropolitan areas, and since 2012 to 2021, that median price went up 94 percent uh, in both places. Um, the um, Homes are less expensive in, in rural areas for uh, all the obvious reasons, but they're going up rapidly everywhere. And so the rural areas haven't been immune from these price pressures. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Kine, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the witnesses for your testimony here today. And Mr. Chairman, thank you for holding such an important hearing. Uh, Dr. Watkins and Dr. Herbert, I'm going to come to you in a moment to uh, get your analysis if you've looked at the use of opportunity zones to expand affordable housing opportunity throughout America. Before I do, though, Mr. Pinto, uh, as a serious witness coming before the committee, to try to lay the blame on the inflationary pressures that our country is facing solely on monetary and fiscal policy of this nation is a bit disingenuous. We all know that inflation is a global phenomenon now, and unless you want to sit here and testify and have us believe that it's just the policies from the current administration or the Federal Reserve that is contributing to inflation, man, uh, that's a big swing and a miss in, in my book. But, Mr. Chairman, I, too, had many success stories in my congressional district on the use of the low-income housing tax credit, large rural western Wisconsin district. In fact, just recently, my old elementary school on the north side of La Crosse, Roosevelt, was converted into an affordable housing unit with the use of the low-income housing tax credit and partial grant money from the American Rescue Plan. Highly successful, lower-income families moving into a high-need area, and there's not a community in America that's not affected by the need for affordable housing. It's just such a, a, an imperative, and it's long past due that Congress gets more serious on this issue. I've been co-chairing the uh, uh, bipartisan National Park Caucus here for the last 14 years, and outside of the challenges that our national parks are facing dealing with climate change, their number one priority is affordable housing and affordable rent for the tens of thousands of employees trying to work in our park system, and they're struggling with that. Now, it was one of the reasons why, now back to you, Dr. Watkins and Herbert, I co-authored the Opportunity Zone legislation to try to bring that early stage capital in economically distressed and uh, depressed areas of our country. And the states have designated those zones. I have communities in my congressional district in Eau Claire and Prairie du Chien that are using OZ funds now to develop affordable housing projects there. And that was really one of the hopes that I would see uh, the private uh, uh, investors uh, invest money in, in these opportunity zones. Have you, Dr. Watkins, looked at these zones at all, the use for expanding affordable housing opportunities? Thank you, Thank you for that question. Um, so yes, we did take a look at opportunity zones as a way to drive revitalization efforts um, early on when the legislation first got passed. And, I, and I, what I will say is that I think opportunity zones um, work in communities that are on the cusp um, of developing but need sort of that extra sort of private capital to get them there. I think that's where it works best at. I think for um, some cities, many of the cities that we work in, um, you know, affordable housing isn't gonna happen without, any, without subsidy and it just doesn't make sense um, in a lot of ways for a private investor to come in and invest in, you know, in a, for instance, like a Flint, Michigan. I mean, Dan is not here, so I, right. you know. But um, the, the sort of profit margin isn't going to be there. And even though a lot of folks um, that have put their capital in opportunity zones um, have a triple bottom line, right? They want to do good. They want to make good money and they want um, things that are good for the environment. Um, hi, Dan, I just mentioned Flint. 
Yeah. Um, but for those uh, cities that are just persistently poor and have faced persistent intergenerational sort of disinvestment, um, we need it. We needed different tools, yeah, I think and, we, and we needed tools you're that highlighting some of the challenges that we're seeing with the OZs right now. Dr. Absolutely. Herbert, have you have you looked at this at all? Uh, Representative, we have not looked at it directly ourselves. We have certainly aware of the research that has been done. And I think, you know, to Representative Kelly's point, you know, creating incentives for private capital to come in has, in, you know, improved capital flows into these areas. As Dr. Watkins said, it's often areas on the cusp. Um, the one thing I would point out, though, I do feel like it's important to design these programs with housing in mind. Mm -hmm. And the opportunity zones, the way it's structured is the return to the investor comes in upon a capital gain. So there's going to be a payoff at the end of the period, right. which is going to undermine the affordability. So while yeah. it might, and, uh, so I would just point to the low-income housing tax yeah, credit. I agree. I, and a lot of the local communities are setting up their OZ kind of strategies and trying to attract this private investment. So a lot of it's being driven at the local level. But we also need to do the transparency bill on the OZ legislation, something that was left out when it was originally passed, and I've teamed up with Mr. Kelly and, and Ms. Wolorski and Mr. Kildee and uh, Ms. Sewell on our side to make sure we got proper reporting and greater transparency in OZ investment and what it's being used for, and that way we can better target, hopefully, uh, affordable housing uh, in the future with this. Absolutely. Thank the gentleman. Let thank me you. recognize the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Rice, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you the witnesses. I. Uh, I think it's without question that the number one threat to low-income housing uh, is rising cost. I mean, if, if housing costs, based on the inflation data this morning, went up 9% year over year, and in fact, in my district, it's double that, uh, obviously you're taking a lot of people who could be buyers uh, uh, out of the equation. And then uh, also with rising interest rates, for if the Fed has to, to raise interest rates to fight inflation, uh, with every point that the interest rates go up, you take millions and millions of potential home buyers, particularly on the low end of the income scale, out of the equation. And I think there's no question um, the idea that this administration hadn't played a huge role in creating this inflation is, I believe, disingenuous. The fact that we, uh, uh, the, the first big and really only big landmark legislation of this administration was the American Rescue Plan under which we borrowed $1.9 trillion, $5,000 for every man, woman, and child in the country that, that our children and grandchildren have to pay back. And uh, that was hyperinflationary. Uh, it acknowledged across the political spectrum that was hyperinflationary. And then this administration's energy policies, hyperinflationary. And now the Fed's got to raise interest rates to fight that hyperinflationary. So all these things reduce availability of housing to people on the low end of the spectrum. Uh, I want to talk, though, for a minute about what the, what the uh, federal government is already doing <coughs> to help people get into low-income housing. And Mrs. Hammerlick, if you'll help me educate the public a little bit about the low-income housing tax credit, what does that amount to for investors? What does the federal government give people to build low-income housing? It is a federal tax credit that um, How much is the credit? Per, How much is the credit? Uh, total investment? Mm, it's nine, I can't tell isn't it 9% per year for 10 years? Oh, 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 oh I see what you mean. Um, yes. Yeah, it is. it is. So that's 90%. The federal government pays 90% of the cost of, of low income housing. You said you're building. Nine, uh, 700 units right now, and you got 200 units under construction uh, uh, in renovation, right? Right. right. And what what Correct. what does the federal government pay your investors to renovate a unit? So the investors are buying well, what, the tax what's, what's the amount? Of, what, what's the amount of the credit for renovating a unit? Um, in the case that we talked about earlier. Isn't it, isn't it 7 percent per year for 10 years? Isn't that right? It's 7 no. percent per year? No. It what usually it? funds, the tax credits usually fund between 70 and 80 percent of the total. Well, but the amount costs. of the credit is 7 percent per year for renovation for 10 years. So the federal government right now, with a low-income housing credit, is paying 90 percent of the uh, original construction cost, and when they're renovated, they pay 70%. Now, I realize that ignores the time value of money, and it's a little less than that, but it's a huge incentive. Now, let me ask you this. What percentage 
of your tenants in these units yes. that you have receive rental assistance from the federal government? For um, Nevada Hand, it's about 10%. 10%? 10%, one zero. Okay. Now, you said, you said so, the, so the federal government subsidizes your cost on the front, 90% gross, to build an apartment, and then they subsidize the rent that the tenant pays. But you said earlier, uh, are you the only low-income housing developer in Nevada? Oh, no. There I'm, are other low-income housing developers in Nevada. We're okay. the largest, and we're a nonprofit developer. Okay. And so how many low-income housing units are being built right now utilizing this 90% credit? How many are being built? Um, I, I want to mention, I've never seen it be 90% credit. Um, for us, it's more like 70 to 80% of okay. the, the capital coming in, because and it's only the, on the 9% deals the time value and not money. taxes and bond deals. Because of the time value no. money. So let no, me, it really isn't. Let, it's let me, the capital stack. How many, how many units are being built right now in Nevada using this credit? Do you know? You know, I can't. I would guess around 1,000. 1,000? So you're building I, 700. I, I can't tell you off the top of my head. You're building 700, and all the other developers out there are only, only building 300, really? Well, not, not all the equity is coming from tax credits. Right, we have a bond financing, we have first mortgage lending, so there's lots of different layers of financing that goes into it besides the low income housing tax credit. Okay, other subsidization, pro, uh, subsidi subsidization programs being provided by the federal Well, government. not necessarily. Sometimes we're getting first mortgages just from a bank, right? And we're just paying um, a first mortgage financing during development. I just, I just wanna be clear you know, we're sitting here talking about the need for low-income housing, and, and I, I certainly agree we need to people have a, to have a place to live. But the idea that the federal government's not doing enough is a little absurd, particularly in the in the, in the light of the low-income housing credit providing 90 percent of the cost of new units. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Pasquale, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you for putting such distinguished panelists together. The American dream of home ownership has become a nightmare. The pandemic desecrated supply chains, exacerbated housing shortages, and contributed to soaring prices. The medium home listing price has increased a staggering 17 percent in just one year. America's tragic history of segregated housing still casts a shadow on this beautiful United States. Black ownership stands at 44 percent, and get this, barely above when Congress passed the Fair Housing Act of 1968. On average, homeowners are worth 38 times more than renters. But this pathway to prosperity is now out of reach for far too many. Last year, our oversight panel held a hearing on expanding housing costs and access. The low-income housing tax credit, compared to everything else that we've done over the years, Democrats and Republicans, is our best affordability tool. Look at the charts, and we can make it much better. Our strongest incentives for home ownership were gutted by the 2017 Republican tax scam. Two trillion dollars, two trillion dollars. What did that have to do with inflation before the skies opened? I mean, you, bl you guys blame everything on, tr on Mr. Biden, even the poverty in Bangladesh. Next, it's the plague. Listen to yourselves. We can reverse the damage of that tax hoax, tax cut hoax, and fully restore itemized deductions for mortgage interest and SALT. With ordinary Americans locked out of the market, private equity fat cats are outbidding families and driving up prices, and I thank you for bringing that out, members of the panel. A housing barometer is registering storm warnings. 
flush with cash and insatiable greed, Wall Street tycoons bought 19% of single-family homes last year. 19%. That, was, that has ballooned, I think, to 28% this year. Private equity aggressively targets lower and moderately priced homes. This is especially true in minority communities. Gee, that's a surprise. Further entrenching shameful racial disparities, which we will not address. These homes are upgraded, flipped, converted to corporate rentals. Wealthy financiers effectively act as slumlords, squeezing vulnerable tenants for all they're worth. Let me ask you this question, Ms. Raymond. Dr. Raymond, thank you for what you stressed in your presentation. I got three quick questions. How does the increasing market power of corporate landlords lead to rising costs for tenants? Question two, how do you institutional investors maximize their profits at rental properties? And three, what actions could Congress take to better regulate monopolistic and discriminatory actions by investors in a housing market? Thank you so much for your question. Uh, first, I'd say that institutional investors um, are a big part of the surging demand over the last couple of years, and they've moved from being distressed property investors to out-competing homeowners, even in this environment of rising prices. Um, in, in the city where I live, Atlanta, we've seen prices increase uh, that, that are being purchased by single-family rental investors, institutional investors. Um, their median prices have gone from $132,000 to $275,000 in two years. So they're rising much faster than um, the prices that we're seeing homeowners pay in the open market. Um, how does this impact tenants? These investors are highly incentivized to very efficiently extract rent um, through uh, hidden fees, um, through late fees, uh, and through increasing rents as often as possible, you know, year on year. Um, so that's part of the way that uh, these firms extract revenues. They also um, delay maintenance. Um, and I, you know, I've talked about some of the uh, some of the ways in which I think Congress could address this. Um, one thing I think needs to happen is understanding the market share within submarkets. So often these firms will claim, oh, we have 2% nationwide. Well, no tenant does a nationwide search mm -hmm. for housing. If you're an urban economist or if you're an antitrust lawyer, you define markets meaningfully, which means in the, in the local region. So looking into um, whether or not these firms have the ability to, to set rents, as has been found in the research, or to increase home prices in the for purchase market, I think is important. For that, we need better data. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you uh, Mr. Mr. Swikert, you're recognized. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, look, it, it, my market's going to be a little different than most other people. I'm the Phoenix Scottsdale <laughs> area. So every single day, I have a couple hundred new residents in my county. Um, and um, the CPI numbers that just came out a couple hours ago. I'm at 12.3% inflation in my district. If you want to do CPIW, I'm at 13.1% inflation. So if you're that family that's been trying to save money and trying to save money so you can actually buy that first house, you're basically getting hammered on both ends, both in the price of the housing, but also the value of that savings is also crashing. Um, but I've been around the housing world my entire life. I'm one of the, I got my real estate license when I was still in high school, um, it, which could explain a couple things. Um, and, and Mr. Pinto, I, I, I want to touch on something. Almost all of our discussion is about financing. You know, we support LIHTC, we support this, we support that. But what about supply? My fear is we're producing capital stacks to help low income to help affordability, you know, we even do it on mortgage interest deductions. But having done a number of subdivisions, I had one little subdivision, it took me three years to finally get my final entitlements to build a half a dozen houses because of the bureaucracy, because of the paperwork, because of uh, the engine, flood engineer I knew broke his leg and disappeared for six months. 
do we also have just a mechanism in a modern world where most of that stuff I could have done on this? Instead, I'm sitting at a counter um, three times a month filling out paperwork because that was the only way it was being accepted. Do we also have the problem of, okay, we, we're fixing things on the capital stack side and the subsidy side, but we're, we need a revolution in what it takes to put pieces of property into production. It is, is, tell me what's wrong with my theory. Well, Representative, we absolutely need more supply, and um, I developed a concept back in 2019 called light touch density, which focuses on uh, ADUs and two units, three units, four units, smaller single family homes, small townhouse uh, units. And much to my surprise, and I only found this out about three months ago, in uh, 2020, a representative or senator in California, state senator in California, uh, Wiener, introduced a bill called the Light Touch Density Bill. And uh, it followed the, both the name and the language that we proposed in 2019. Uh, long story short, that bill was enacted in California in September, took effect uh, on uh, just January 1st of this year. A companion bill that also is a light touch density bill, uh, S Senate Bill 9, uh, was also passed in September and also took effect January 1st of this year. So that's the kind of progress we need. We need to get the states and local governments to start providing by right zoning in uh, locations that you can build. Okay. That and, would add much more supply. Okay. Uh, I, and I've seen, read some great articles about the me mechanisms of saying, okay, these have um, sort of fixed entitlements to it that you can build into. Fine. Um, but then how do we also incentivize speed? You know, capital is expensive, time is very, very valuable, need is there. I'm in a community that's probably thousands and thousands and thousands of units short. Uh, for even middle class, lower middle class in, in my community. I need production of housing. And yet, even if I have my entitlements, going through the steps of getting the next permit, to getting it reviewed, to getting this, can sometimes be over a year, can be multiple years. So, so is it, do we need something also of the modernization of the methodology, even down to how building inspections are done? The short answer is yes. All I would say is I don't think the federal government. Well, that's the problem. In yeah, that. you beat me to the punchline. You took, you, you yeah. killed my punchline, um, and that is um, we've done lots of things on the capital stack. Um, Tom Rice here actually nailed a bunch of it. How do we incentivize our communities to functionally enter this century technology-wise so they can move faster? Um, last thing, because I only have seconds on this. You've had multiple discussions here about um, corporate investment buying houses compared to mom and pa as, as individuals. Do you know of any study that's been done out there to understand um, tax differential? I get to deduct my mortgage interest, okay? They get to use a 1031 exchange. Is there, even just from the way we do our, do our tax code, um, has anyone looked at the value differentials there? I have not. Okay. Yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Sanchez, you're recognized. Thank you, um, uh, Mr. Chairman. And I want, uh, this is a really important opportunity for us to focus on one of the most important issues in our communities, and that is the inadequate supply of affordable housing. And I want to thank our witnesses for helping us to understand how the federal government can do its part to fix the problem and what are some of the contributing factors to the problem. Now, I understand that for some of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, um, they've become accustomed to ignoring the witness, uh, the witness testimony, witnesses who have expertise and experience in working on these very intractable problems, um, because it's much easier to just blame everything on President Biden. Um, and Mr. Pinto, I have to take exception to some of your, <laughs> your comments today. I don't think I've laughed so hard in a long time. We had a global pandemic, and the entire globe is experiencing inflation. We're not unique in that. The United States is not the only country experiencing inflation, and it's not because of our federal policies. It's because of supply chain issues. That's As a colleague right. on the other side of the aisle said, you know, more people chasing goods. Well, when factories shut down because people are sick, that means less lumber that's being produced, that's less drywall, less nails, and more dollars competing for that. So I, I, I just find your testimony not, not rooted in reality, but, but uh, 
let me just present a few facts here. In the last year in LA County alone, median rent jumped nearly 16% for vacant apartments. Too many first time home buyers are being priced out of the market. Too many working families are under pressure to make their rent and they're being squeezed by unscrupulous landlords. And too many people in our communities are experiencing homelessness. But that's not a new problem. Um, in LA County, only 46% of families own their home. Uh, and we can't ignore that problem anymore. And there are a lot of complex reasons why the supply hasn't kept up with the demand for all of the types of housing that we need, not just single family homes. Um, the forces that turned our lives upside down over the past few years during the pandemic have been working on the housing market too. Um, and that includes uh, supply chain disruptions to basic shifts in how we're living. Um, but now we are expecting hardworking families who are coming out of the pandemic to compete in bidding wars with private equity firms for the homes that are available. And that is unsustainable. That there's no way the little guy is going to outbid these big uh, uh, private equity firms that have lots of cash to throw around. Um, but there are solutions to the problem, uh, especially uh, you know, obviously building more housing, we need more multifamily units for low-income housing uh, uh, for folks who are experiencing the most pressure. And we know how to do that. This committee knows how to do that, expanding and improving the low-income housing tax credit and leveraging the tax code to drive investment in areas where it's needed most. And we've done um, some of those things in the past. Um, I want to also mention that local policy is a critical part of the equation uh, because I want to clear up some of the misconceptions or uh, misinformation for my communities. Um, Dr. Herbert, a myth that I often hear is that in blue states, it's our local environmental laws that are to blame, uh, but can you talk a little bit about the biggest drivers of construction of new homes? Um, because. Um, I think it's important for folks to understand the, the, the root of these, uh, of these issues. Uh, thank you for the question, Representative Sanchez. Uh, you know, certainly, um, there's reasons why we need to regulate for the environment. We want to protect our wetlands. We want to protect our air and our water. There's no doubt that those, those regulations, in some cases, may go too far. But when we're talking about building housing, what we're talking about is building the density of housing that we need. I'll give you an example. In Connecticut, there's a Connecticut zoning atlas that went through and systematized all the information about zoning in Connecticut. They found that 91% of land in Connecticut is zoned for single family, 2% is zoned for multifamily. So if we want to look at the root cause, it's not the environmental regulations, the land that is zoned is zoned heavily for single family housing. Of that 91%, 81% has one acre lots and 51% has two acre lots. That's the problem. Thank you, because that leads into my next question. Um, which is nimbyism, not in my backyard, which we see in California all the time. I can't tell you how many times I've encountered that when we've talked about building public or multifamily housing uh, in the communities that I represent. Can you talk about the racial equity implications of single family zoning restrictions in communities like mine that are already largely built out? In order to have a diversity of households in a community, you have to have a diversity of household types. Uh, if, if all we have are single family homes, all we're gonna have are higher income households. Now, not that people of color don't have higher incomes as well, but we know that people of color disproportionately have lower incomes. So in order to have a diversity of household types, people of color, different household formations, single people, uh, we need to have a range of household types, not just single family housing, townhouses, apartments, and the like. Thank you so much, I appreciate your testimony. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Dr. Weinstrup, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for being here today with your, your testimony. Um, housing affordability is something that I'm hearing about a lot in my, from my constituents in Ohio's 2nd District. Um, and broadly speaking, uh, low- and middle-income Americans are often hit the hardest by housing costs, regardless of whether that's for home ownership or, or renters themselves. And these costs place strains on household budgets, they limit enhanced educational opportunities, impair workforce mobility, slow job creation, and increase financial risks across the board. Unfortunately, these days we're living through a period of record inflation, skyrocketing costs, supply chain challenges, rising interest rates, all of which make home ownership increasingly out of reach for many, many more Americans, unfortunately. And this also affects renters who have seen rent payments rise tremendously over the last year and a half. 
The cost of living for all Americans is going up across the board, and the policies we're seeing uh, from many and from this administration are directly contributing to rising economic hardships. Facts are stubborn things, or at least in America they used to be. Sadly and factually, under one-party control in Washington, inflation has reached a 40-year high. Interest rates are rising, and the economic uncertainty caused by their efforts to raise taxes on small businesses have placed tremendous strain on hardworking Americans. And so like many of my, my colleagues, I'm hearing about this from constituents back home, including in the housing affordability space. On the supply side, I've heard from developers who've had to walk away from multiple housing projects in Cincinnati and elsewhere in Ohio due to increasing contractor and material costs. In fact, one house builder reports that they've had to start including escalation clauses in their contracts for the majority of their suppliers due to the volatility of the market and the uncertainties of today's economy. In Cincinnati, we're seeing a 27% decline in single family permits from last year. In response, to mortgage rates rising. Residential construction material costs are up 40.4%. And there are more than 2,000 open construction jobs needing to be filled in greater Cincinnati area alone. So the policies that have been acted from the American Rescue Plan Act have not made life more affordable. In fact, the results have proven to be to the contrary. Although the pandemic had many negative effects on our society, on our economy, uh, I will say that bad policy after a pandemic can't be blamed on the pandemic. It's bad policy, policies that have been proven to fail over, throughout our history. Across industry, across income levels, across the, the country, Americans are getting crushed by the economy that has unfolded. So, and what we're seeing to me is under the guise of compassion, these policies fail us, especially the most needy. Back home, the message I received from my constituents is uh, not to raise taxes. That's the last thing they want. You know, this inflation is a crippling tax on people. So especially on Americans that are most needy. And what they want is the long-term tax and economic certainty that uh, families and businesses can plan for the future. So we need to look at policies that we've enacted uh, that have been proven to work for Americans, and we need to also be honest with ourselves and look at policies that have not. We need to build on policies that, that promote pro-growth, such as the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, which it did, and laid the foundation for competitive wages, record low unemployment, steady economic growth. Policies that don't put the federal government in the position of picking winners and losers, but rather provides opportunities for all Americans. In my district, I have both major metropolitan area, Cincinnati, and rural areas that stretch into Appalachia. And while I believe state and local governments are better positioned for addressing the unique needs of their communities, I think Congress can pursue policies that can be helpful and give them tools that they need. Uh, Mr. Pinto, when looking at the housing affordability crisis we have today, what trends do you see in urban areas like Cincinnati compared to rural areas like Appalachia, and how can the federal government better address the crisis across that region? Thank you uh, for that question. Uh, the, I keep coming back to we need more supply. Uh, we don't need more stimulus because if you have inadequate supply, that immediately gets capitalized into higher prices. Um, so we need more supply, and the solution for that is we have to rely on state and local governments uh, to, the, to uh, add to that supply. We've been looking at places like Cincinnati and rural areas uh, and trying to come up with uh, suggestions. I've been meeting with um, re representatives of Austin and uh, Spokane and uh, Little Rock and a dozen other places uh, about how they can use uh, the research that we've been doing on light touch density to increase their supply, and I'd be happy to do the same for the Cincinnati area. I appreciate that. I Thank back. you. Gentlemen, time has expired. Ms. Delbaney, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, for holding this important hearing. I want to thank all our witnesses for um, being here and for your testimony. Um, our nation is facing an affordable housing crisis. We have for years. Um, it's been worsened by the pandemic and now is one, in the, one of the leading drivers of inflation in the U.S. Now more than ever, we've got to increase the supply of affordable housing. 
Um, together with my colleagues, um, Representatives Beyer, Walorski, and Wenstrup, I've championed legislation that would do just that. The Affordable Housing Credit Improvement Act would make critical investments in the housing credit, which is the primary tool for financing virtual all affordable rental housing since 1986. Um, the housing credit, which we also call the low-income um, housing tax credit. Our bill is estimated to build or preserve over 2 million affordable rental homes, support 3 million jobs, provide $345 billion in wages and business income, and generate $119 billion in tax revenue over the next 10 years. There are a growing number of states, including um, my home state of Washington, that are running up against our annual private activity bond cap, which is tied to their ability to access the 4% housing credit. So um, in Washington state alone, there are only 31 affordable homes available for every 100 extremely low income people. So we cannot afford inaction. Um, Ms. Hammernick, I wondered if you could talk to us a bit more about just how oversubscribed the housing credit program is and the impact that that's having right now. Yeah. You know, uh, it is oversubscribed across the country. The, it's fiercely competitive to uh, receive awards for the tax credits, and um, the housing finance agencies are working hard to make sure that they are funding projects that um, need the credits and can show real impact in the community. So the, it's, it's, definitely, um, it's definitely a strong need and very competitive. Um, could you also speak to how reducing the bond financing test could improve the efficiency of using the private activity bond cap for states so they can better support families that are looking for affordable housing and also help us increase the supply of affordable housing? Sure. The um, housing that's bond financed um, receive 4% tax credit automatically. And at least 50% of the development cost currently must be initially financed with tax exempt bonds. So the proposed legislation would decrease that to 25%. And really the 50% number is just a number. It was, it's just arbitrary. So um, allowing that decrease will allow states to use their bond authority more efficiently and um, help more uh, developers access those bonds. Thanks. You described the low-income housing tax credit as the backbone of our nation's affordable housing system. And though it's often used in conjunction with other housing programs, the credits or what actually makes those developments possible. I wondered if you could speak more to the interaction of the housing credit and other programs and whether these properties would be possible, um, some of these projects would be possible without the credit. Oh, sure. Um, you know, the 9% credit, um, when it's allocated, funds typically around 75% of total development cost. So these other gap financers that come in um, are can be lots of different things. Um, sometimes we just need a first mortgage and we're able to work with uh, a bank to fill that gap. Other times, maybe it's home program um, funds, maybe it's national housing trust fund, but those other programs really are designed to be gap financers and to target certain populations. So you can see when you look at tax credit deals, um, Primarily, it's less than 60% of area me median income. And local states will, in their qualified action, or their, yeah, their qualified allocation plans, are able to um, put certain priorities in. So when we have um, ranking member Brady talking about one size fits all, that's the beauty of the tax credit program, is that it lets local jurisdictions have control and put priorities on what they want to fund and how it looks in suburban, rural, and different areas. But inside those plans, um, you know, targeting those certain populations, some of these other funding sources uh, demand that, and so they're natural gap fillers. Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate your testimony, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentlelady for yielding back. Uh, Mr. Estes, you're rec recognized. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I'm glad we're having this appropriate hearing because there's really some alarming news coming out of the, the housing market and the issues there. Uh, before I get into my remarks about the housing, I, I want to talk, uh, kind of clear something up around inflation. You know, I was talked earlier about worldwide inflation versus U.S. inflation, and and one of the things, just want to make sure that when we think through the po process, when the federal government puts in policies that limit the production of oil and gas in the United States, obviously rising the 
increasing the price of gas in the United States, it also reduces the amount of gas around the world, which increases prices there. And we see that through uh, inflation, we see it through use of diesel and, and other transportation costs. So I wanted to just, as we look through that, I mean, we've seen a lot of impact on, on uh, what's uh, frequently being called Biden inflation and the hike in mortgage rates having a huge impact on pricing. Uh, we looked at residential housing costs uh, going up 19% over last year. Uh, and a lot of that's due to pretty much everything uh, available in construction. You know, if you look at the last year, uh, since President Biden has come into office, the average price of the house in the United States has increased by $100,000. In my district in Kansas, uh, that reflects about a 14.5% increase in the price. Uh, you compare that to uh, the first 16 months of President Trump's term, that, that cost increase was about 3.4 percent. So it really is reflective of what uh, bad government policies can do uh, in terms of impacting uh, people in their real lives. About 20 percent of uh, Kansans in my district pay more than 50 percent of their income on rent. That's not to mention, uh, you know, running into bare stock or bare, shell, bare shelves and out of stock items like baby formula that people are going through and experiencing now. So we've really got to focus on making sure that uh, uh, how do we keep the American families from hurting after, after this year of uh, total government, uh, total Democrat control in Washington. You know, uh, first time home buyers using FHA loans are almost completely shut out of the market. Uh, Kansas realtors are telling me about clients that have been denied multiple times over the past year as they've competed um, against conventional and cash offers for homes that are selling for tens of thousands of dollars uh, more over the asking price. Some buyers with FHA loans have completely stopped looking. You know, a lot of people are feeling these price increases. You know, a single mother reached out to me to share her experience. She wrote, during the past two years, I've experienced extreme financial hardships, first due to COVID and now higher prices on everything. I'm not someone who asks for help or has used government assistance. I've always worked and taken care of my home and child, and I'm very scared of losing my home and transportation and struggling to make sure that I have rent, utilities, and food. So when we look at uh, you know, the housing slowdown that's brought on by inflation and rate hike and interest, we see ownership handicapped by a lot of red tape uh, regulations that have come out of uh, currently the administration, but also uh, at states levels as well. For example, a, a 19, or excuse me, a, a 2021 HUD report lays out clearly that regulatory barriers often limit individuals' opportunity to enter the market. The policies of the administration seem to be directly responsible for making it more difficult for families to own a home and enjoy the American dream. We need to prioritize policies that promote strong families, and strong families will once again help bring about a strong America. Mr. Pino, I, I know uh, you've had been asked several questions as we go through this, and I know in this format it, it doesn't necessarily allow enough time to, to answer some of the, the details as we run through time. I do have a few minutes or uh, some time left, and I wanted to talk a little bit about what policies do you see that we could pursue to help make uh, affordable housing more available and particularly help first-time home buyers get into the marketplace? Thank you for that question. Uh, let me just reiterate something I mentioned in my opening remarks which is the, the lift home uh, 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 program to reduce uh, the mortgage rate on 20-year uh, loans so that the payment is the same as on a 30-year loan. Um, many, if not all, of the witnesses have testified to the wealth gap uh, that's both uh, racial-based and uh, income-based, and income -based, of course. And the reason we have that wealth gap, to some extent based on recent uh, the recent past is because we continue to put uh, low-income individuals in very high-risk loans that don't amortize very quickly. Um, and the lift home with a 20-year term would uh, have twice as much home equity in the first uh, five years, would uh, reduce the um, default rate by about 50 percent, and would create really intergenerational wealth for those uh, home buyers. Uh, and that really would go a long way towards uh, helping uh, create uh, wealth that uh, can be passed on to the next generation. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Suazi, you're recognized. Uh, thanks to all the witnesses. We really appreciate you taking the time to be here with us, and your advice is very much appreciated. Um, 
You know, we're all fighting down here in Washington all the time. It's like we're living in two different worlds, and we really just have to come together and figure out how we can solve people's problems that they face. 65% uh, of Americans are homeowners. So, I mean, you know, you could argue that their house is going up by $100,000 is a positive thing. Uh, if they were going down, you'd be hearing the people on the other side say, oh, that's terrible, the house's values are going down. So let's just figure out what the problems are. We heard from, I forget if it was Dr. Watkins or Dr. Raymond, the two doctors, uh, well, three doctors we've got here, uh, that homeownership of whites is 75%, and for black and brown people, it's closer to 45%. Now, I'm from Long Island, where Levittown was started, okay? Great homeownership for returning veterans after World War II created great generational wealth. But all the black and brown people were frozen out of getting that. So we've got to figure out how can we create another program that says, let's create, let's encourage, Democrats and Republicans seem to agree that home ownership is good. So let's agree we want to create more home ownership. And let's take our differing viewpoints and figure out what past programs there were that worked and were good and fix them so that they take into account that we want to help black and brown people. We also want to do something because senior citizens are in a lot of trouble. We also want to help disabled people that have no place uh, to live. Uh, let's figure out what we've got to do to create these programs to create more home ownership and create more generational wealth for people. So I want to ask everybody to please just share with me uh, what you think the best program you've ever heard of in the past that was really successful and what's the thing that you're advocating that would be like that now? So I have three minutes left, so everybody gets about 35 seconds, okay? So Dr. Raymond, what do you want to say? Uh, sure, I, you know, I agree that um, the creation of the secondary mortgage giants, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, FHA Mortgage Insurance, those have been fantastic programs and we need to continue them. I'd also just want to say that um, it could be a lot easier to be a tenant in this country um, that we will never have 100% home ownership and that working people and people who can't work for very good reasons because they're retired, because they're caring for others or because they're disabled uh, rent homes and every person in this country deserves a, a stable, safe, affordable roof over their head. Um, so I completely agree with the endorsement of home ownership and I absolutely think that um, the historic programs that we've used has, have been great. I, I think that the foreclosure crisis and the privatization of a lot of these mechanisms was very destructive to home ownership, um, particularly among minority communities. And I also want to um, just say that I think uh, re renting is important too, and we should pay attention to tenants' rights. And you know, and we have so much public housing in America that's such a, a really a failure in a lot of ways that we could, could make it so much better than it is. It was supposed to be a transition to home ownership, and you know, I love public housing, and it really could be fantastic, and there's wonderful families living there. We have to figure out how they can get to the next step and we can make that a housing available for people. All right, Dr. Watkins, what did you want to say? Thank you, and I'm, I'm happy to be among a fellow Long Islander. I'm from Roosevelt. Oh, uh, that's where I grew up. I'm home, so. we need you. Yes. Um, so a couple of things. Uh, one is that I serve as president and um, or I, I serve as chair of Grounded Solutions Network. That is the largest network of shared equity and community land trust. I think this is one, um, one amazing option that we need to consider. This creates permanently affordable housing for families, especially in those high market cities yeah. uh, where becoming a homeowner is increasingly getting- And where better. we have all these vacant properties that could be turned around. Like in Buffalo is this great example of places they have all these vacant properties. That's right, that's right. Turn them around. That's right. And number two, so you're the land use pusher. Okay. Yeah. And number two is about converting these vacant and abandoned properties into um, real affordable housing opportunities. We need to figure out and work through this mortgage mechanism. Currently, there is not a mortgage mechanism to grant loans and mortgages for families that may want to buy a house in Detroit for 75. I've been advocating for a public bank in New York, for example. Oh, so it would be a great thing to have. All right, Dr. Herbert, and listen, your organization is so much better that you're running it instead of Dan Kildee now. So <laughs> you're doing a great job. Dr. Herbert? Uh, I'll be brief. I think you know, the, the number one obstacle to low income and people of color getting into home ownership is a lack of savings for a down payment. You know, we know we need to have safe credit. So in the, in the last, in the housing boom, we didn't have safe credit. So job one is to make sure you have safe credit that you can afford when you get the mortgage, you can withstand hardship, but we need to get down payment assistance to close that gap. Median price in America, you need $25,000 down. Nobody who's uh, low income has that amount of money. We need to give people that stake, table stakes to get into the game. 
Mr. Chairman, I, I didn't get Mr. Pinto to give his 30 seconds, but I have to yield back my time. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Dr. Murphy, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all the witnesses that are coming up today. I, I don't mean to beat a dead horse with the inflation issue, but it's just a huge wagon train that we have uh, going across the country, so there's a new horse kind of everywhere. So um, that's the main thing that people care about. Not, it's not all the other ancillary issues. It's inflation, inflation, inflation. You know, before the ARP was passed, we had an inflation rate, well, I guess the Federal Reserve had a target of about 2%. And one year after the American Rescue Plan has been passed, which was President Biden's signature accomplishment, inflation rose to a staggering 8.6 percent, and as we found out today, it's now 9.1 percent, highest in 40 years. Time and time again, unfortunately, President Biden has pushed blame on this, on that, and rather than actually taking ownership, where he himself actually said the buck, buck stopped with him. The reason housing isn't affordable and I would agree with your point, Mr. Herbert, about uh, institutional saving or that the individuals need saving. But a lot of blame gets put on private investors, private equity, which owns less than 2% of, uh, of the institutions that we're talking about. It's also because Democrats have passed and continue to pass inflationary policies. These are, I mean, even the Obama administration economists are saying this. The cost of building materials is up 19%. Day-to-day -day cost of running building operations is up, and this includes, especially in my district, which is a very rural district, even getting gas to drive to and from when you have an hour commute every day. It just continues to add up. There's still a lack of workers. We need to get people back in the workforce. I'm going to give you a specific example. Um, in Jacksonville, North Carolina, which is in Onslow County, which is uh, probably the biggest county in my district, Camp Lejeune, there are a lot of uh, military folks, a lot of veterans. Um, the cost of <clears throat> housing has increased 20 percent. Now these are these are guys, especially our enlisted, that come in and actually try to find a house. They're going to be there for at least three years. Housing prices that have increased tremendously since the American Rescue Plan has come in. The Department of Defense only increased the housing allowance 5.6 percent in 2022. So with inflation at 9.1 percent, housing costs up 20 percent, we are hurting our own military in this specific situation. And what are we doing? What do what, what our Democratic colleagues want to do? Spend more, add more inflationary pressure. This version of Build Back Better <clears throat> includes, just so everybody knows, a 3.8 percent tax on small businesses. 98 percent of businesses in the country are small businesses. And they claim it's just a tax on the higher income individuals. Honestly, guys, that's hogwash. You have to understand that this is a fundamental lack of understanding of what small businesses are. 57% in North Carolina of private sector employees are by these small businesses, these pass-through businesses. The Joint, Tax, Joint Committee on Taxation analyzed this and said that the tax on, on millions of middle-class Americans, this tax will be actually on many, many more individuals below $400,000. So let me ask you this, with all these things, the inflationary pressures, with housing going up, with gas continuing to rise, Mr. Pinto, what impact, given this tax on 3.8% tax on small businesses, what do you think this impact will be, will have on our single multifamily, multifamily, or, uh, excuse me, multifamily rental market? Thank you for that question. I think the impact will be that uh, Prices will go up, construction costs will go up, inflation will be higher, both for house prices and rents, uh, and there'll be less homes built, which will then make the problem even worse. It, it is going in the wrong direction. Right. So it, is it fair to say this is, <clears throat> this is literally showing a lack of understanding of the problem at this point in time and actually making it worse I, I think rather than it, making it better? It's a lack of understanding about how the market works, and it goes back to what you talked about, about inflation. It was very clear that what happened uh, with inflation was we had too much demand chasing too few goods. But the amount of goods that was being sold was up tremendously, but you couldn't possibly keep up with the massive amount of demand that came from all the stimulus and the easy money that the Fed was pouring into the market. That's what really created the inflation. And the rest of the world follows the Fed when it comes to interest rates. Right. The Fed doesn't set into, uh, follow the interest rates of Europe. Europe follows what goes on in the United States. Right, right, exactly right. And you know, if you look about gas prices being so much more in Europe, their taxation rate is infinitely higher than in the United States. So we, by gas prices, have, have markedly increased our gas prices over the rest of the world. 
So, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like for the record to submit um, a letter from uh, 190 small business organizations that was sent to the Democratic leadership opposing this 3.8 percent increase on tax on small businesses. Gentlemen's time has expired. Dr. Davis, submitting recognize. submitting the uh, letter. For me, I submitted a letter. Just want to recognize that the Without letter. Without objection. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Dr. Watkins. Let me thank you and all of our witnesses. Uh, let me welcome you as a fellow Chicagoan and also acknowledge the tremendous work that the School of Social Work at the University of Illinois, where Dean Creasy has sent many outstanding social workers all over the country, and I keep meeting them every day. During the pandemic, we saw clearly that the tax code can help provide direct assistance to struggling Americans to alleviate poverty and improve quality of life. Today, I join with Representatives Gomez, Panetta, and Peters to reintroduce the Rent Relief Act to help families of struggling renters earning less than $100,000 a year with an annual advance refundable tax credit. The monthly credit would cover a percentage of the difference between 30% of their income and the actual cost to rent. The bill is supported by over two dozen housing and family advocates as part of a comprehensive approach to ending homelessness, complementing the low-income housing tax credit, vouchers, and eviction moratorium. Given your work with low-income families, do you see this as an aid to helping those individuals meet the cost of daily living? Thank you so much for that question, Congressman. Yes, I do. I do think this will be um, a really big opportunity for renters that have to deal with the skyrocketing um, rental costs these days. And especially if you're talking about renters that make um, 100,000 and less, when we think about the coastal cities where um, rents of one and two bedroom apartments are really beyond sort of what uh, regular working people can afford, I do think this sort of um, tax relief subsidy would really help um, hardworking Americans be able to uh, better um, afford rent, not have to use more than 30% of their income um, toward paying rent. They can pay for other things like childcare, transportation, um, and, and healthcare, which become all huge issues that Americans have to, have to grapple with. So I think um, this uh, tax relief is um, important, it's courageous, and it's needed. Thank you very much, and, and I thank you for your outstanding work. Ms. Hamrick, I know that you're in Nevada, but I must thank you for the tremendous work that you did when you ran the Illinois Housing Development Authority, IDA. And let me ask you, as you developed and helped develop low-income uh, housing for individuals with low incomes, how do you see the question of rent fitting into that, and do you think this approach could also help those individuals? I'm fascinated by this. Um, I, I think it's really interesting. Um, it's essentially creating uh, a, a rental assistance program through a tax credit. I think it's fascinating, and it's really um, something that is um, meaningful. And every, uh, when I keep thinking about um, what the actual rent is versus the 30% and what that gap is. I think the progression between the income levels and the percentage of the gap seems absolutely spot on. I also think that using the 100% of the small area farm fair market rent is really smart. I think this is gonna, it's, it's fascinating to kind of walk through this public policy, but right now um, we're, we're supportive. Thank you very much and thank you again you know, it just turns out that Illinois' loss was Nevada's gain. Thank you both, and Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Mr. Chairman, I am yielding back my time. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Mr. Kildee, you're recognized? Oh, oh, uh, excuse me. Oh, 
Council. Ms. Moore, I, I'm sorry I didn't know you were virtual. Uh, Ms. Moore, you're recognized. I am, I, I am virtual and I am real. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. And, and let me just thank all of our witnesses uh, for the important testimony that they bring to us. I just want to uh, start out, I think, with uh, our, uh, our esteemed uh, Republican witness. Um, you know, uh, I am so surprised. We've had so much talk about the high cost of, of housing and inflationary costs. You would think that this all started uh, since we passed the American Rescue Plan. And I'm wondering what our witness thinks about the Great Recession in 2007, 2008, uh, when we had so many predatory lenders, certainly uh, in the Black community, uh, home ownership, uh, basically the bottom fell out of it. And in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, we went from, uh, you know, like uh, 50, 60 percent of 56% people owning their homes into uh, half of that after the Great Recession. I'm wondering, does he think that the that this housing, lack of housing uh, availability started uh, with the passage of the American Rescue Plan? Just yes or no? No. You think it started with the American Rescue Plan? Thank you for that, for that uh, no, answer. No, I said no. You, you said, did it start? Oh, oh, and I oh, said no. no. Oh, Okay, because I was going to go on, so thank you for that. Um, I realize, uh, Dr. Herbert and Dr. Watkins, that the meat of the Neighborhood Homes Investment Act is to provide uh, the ability for de developers to acquire uh, dilapidated property. Uh, but I continue, of course, to worry about uh, government and federally subsidized displacement. And so I'm wondering... And I know, Dr. Watkins, you talked about stuff that we've been trying for decades to do, like, uh, you know, our, the National Housing Trust and other sort of vehicles to prevent this. But very specifically, I'd like to hear, in my brief amount of time, what would run concurrent with the passage of the Neighborhood Housing Investment Plan to make sure that there was equity and we weren't just providing a subsidy to investors, but enabling homeowners to re remain in their homes. Um, I live in a community, for example, where uh, you know two thirds of the housing stock was built before 1960. And quite frankly, most of them were, were like in the 1920s and 30s. And so the repairs are just too astronomical for an ordinary investor. So I'd just like to hear briefly from you all the things, the quick bullets of things that we can do right now. No, I, um, thank you so much for your question. And um, I really appreciate it. And I think we absolutely have to hold um, developers um, accountable. I mean, and so I will say this, um, the Neighborhood Homes Investment Act is a bit different in this regard. One is that um, developers would not get the tax credit until the actual transaction is complete. So um, they don't get it sort of before, if they do any sort of rehabilitation to a dilapidated property, they don't get that credit before that property is transferred to a potential homeowner. Right? And so for um, owner-occupied properties that want to do renovations and they hire a developer to come in um, to do those renovations, again, homeowners are living in those homes, homeowners are staying in those homes, and developers have to put their own capital up first, and then they get reimbursed. And so um, the other thing that I want to point out is that 63% of all eligible Neighborhood Homes Investment Act um, tracks are communities, um, are slated for communities of color. So this um, tax credit is directly going to helping um, black and brown and indigenous communities. And again, developers have to put the, their dollars up first, and then they get reimbursed toward after the transaction happens. Oh, okay, know. okay, just just very specifically about providing some equity for people who want to stay in their homes, that they don't want their legacy homes to have to be turned over to a developer in order to to upgrade the neighborhood. Absolutely. This is actually to protect homeowners that want to stay in their homes for the owner occupied part of it, that want to stay in their neighborhood, stay in their homes, and be able to capture and keep that equity that they've worked so hard for. 
And so how can they qualify for the financing? Well, I would just add to what Dr. Watkins was saying is that uh, the ingredients for success are certainly making sure that the projects are developed safely and soundly, uh, but also we need to make sure that those home buyers are prepared, that they understand the obligations of home ownership, so good home buyer education and counseling, making sure they get into safe mortgage products that they qualify for, and then also making sure these investments happen at scale. The way this program is going to be successful is not through one or two homes, but through neighborhoods entire neighborhoods are converted so that that disinvestment cycle that Dr. Watkins described in her testimony is turned around and becomes a virtuous cycle of investment and not one of disinvestment. My, my time is expired. Thank you. Thank the gentlewoman's you. time is expired. Mr. Chairman, without you. objection, Mr. Chairman, can I enter into the record the testimony of a John Johnson who testified before the Select Committee on Disparities, Declining Home Ownership and Increasing External Investment in Milwaukee's Home Rental Market, for the record. Without objection, such will be the order. Uh, Thank the, you. The committee will adjourn for 10 minutes, or excuse me, recess for 10 minutes, and uh, we ask that all the members who are uh, voting come back as quickly as they possibly can. The committee stands in recess.
the other thing that I'm, I'm not a They didn't quite say it that way, but um, it was just on a minute ago. Yeah. 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 Look, the, the point is that you never hear about what gets crowded out by low income housing tax credit. And I believe that you can't say, oh, it added 1.2 million or whatever the number is, because you can't prove how much actual or what, what got crowded out, which I think is. The Ways and Means Committee will now reconvene, and the chair will recognize the gentlelady from California. Ms. Chu to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Dr. Raymond, I'm chair of the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus. Um, and I know that communities of color often face even higher burdens of rent and housing in high cost areas like Southern California. Now, you have been doing a unique and incredibly important thing, and that is studying housing distress in Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander or NHPI households in Los Angeles County. This, what you are studying is very, very welcome and not done before. Um, and um, I understand that you found that these communities were hit harder by the foreclosure crisis and had a harder time recovering as prices continue to rise. So can you talk about what you found in your study, the specific housing challenges that NHPI households face and how we can improve access to affordable housing opportunities for members of these communities? Absolutely, thank you so much, Representative Chu. Uh, the research that I did on studying the housing distress among uh, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander households in LA County uh, found that during the lead up to the foreclosure crisis, uh, these communities were um, barred access to safe, affordable mortgage credit, and 27% of uh, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander uh, mortgages were subprime. Um, and after the foreclosure crisis, these, crisis, these high risk, uh, oftentimes predatory products uh, led to foreclosure, and there was a 3.6% uh, purchase mortgage uh, foreclosure rate every single year uh, in the years following the foreclosure crisis among these communities. And this was uh, devastating to home ownership among Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders in LA County. Um, in, the, in the years that followed, there was a 40% decline in purchase mortgage originations. And particularly in uh, Pacific Islander enclaves like Carson um, or Long Beach, um, you saw 60% and just an almost complete um, eradication of new home ownership. Uh, purchase mortgage originations in these areas. When interviews with uh, Native Hawaiian, uh, Samoan, and Tongan uh, residents of LA County, um, residents shared that rising rents, credit checks, and eviction histories were serious barriers to housing, and that having a homeowner within the extended family represented an important resource, preventing unsheltered homelessness spells, permitting families to save or endure a lengthy housing search. Um, the other thing that came out of these interviews was that Pacific Islanders' attachment to neighborhood and church are a really important part of cultural retention, family, and community-based social networks um, are also a bulwark against declining affordability, extreme housing distress, and the difficulty of navigating com complex bureaucracies. So better coordination between housing nonprofits and existing social institutions could improve access to existing housing programs. We noted that the Samoan community had access to the Office of Samoan Affairs, but the Tongan community did not have a similar institution, and that made it harder for them uh, to access housing resources. I mean, also, their um, community-based credit repair programs, a lot of people were engaged in really expensive um, 
overly expensive programs to repair your credit. Um, but they're actually uh, programs out of, for example, the Mission Asset Fund. Uh, they create lending circles within tight-knit communities uh, like Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander um, churches and dance groups um, in which people can uh, repair credit in ways that are very affordable and also reinforce existing social ties. So thanks very much for your Thank question. You so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Raymond. Uh, Ms. Heimernick, uh, homelessness is a big issue in my LA area, but my, in my district, the city of Pasadena has made sharp reductions in their rate of homelessness. Uh, for example, just last week, I was at the groundbreaking ceremony for a new 70 unit support, permanent supportive housing development for formerly homeless seniors. Uh, and it is uh, called the Heritage Square South, but it will include a permanent supportive housing. Um, and also we found that project-based rental assistance or housing vouchers have played a critical role in enabling Pasadena to be able to build these kind of projects. Can you talk mm -hmm. about your work with permanent supportive housing and how it reduces homelessness and how uh, project-based housing vouchers fit into this? Sure. Um, thank you for the question. It, permanent supportive housing is near and dear to my heart, and I'm congratulations. I'm really happy that happened in your district. It, you know, the vouchers are absolutely essential because in many times um, the folks that are living in permanent supportive housing, their goal is just to remain housed, right? And the providers um, are providing strong supportive services to um, help them with whatever needs their particular family has. So the vouchers are key to being able to help people remain housed because they're just not having to worry about the rent being paid. Mm -hmm. They are able to focus on some of the other issues that um, maybe are related to their disability or their situation in homelessness. So it works well with the LIHTC program. Um, um, it has to have a rental assistance component and it has to have a strong supportive service component. Thank the gentlelady. Let me recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Buchanan, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank all of our witnesses for being here today. I'm just looking at some numbers I got last night because I wanted to figure out in our area, our region, Sarasota, uh, you know, the appreciation or the cost uh, additionally to build a home. And during the first 16 months of the Trump administration, it went up 5%. Uh, and our first, the Biden administration, the first 16 months, it's gone up 38.6%, almost 40% homes in our area. It's shocking to me. I've never seen anything like this in 40 years about that going up. I had a, a young lady tell me that her goal was to be able to get, in terms of the American dream, buy a house in the next five years, saving up. She said she doesn't think she can do it in 10 years or maybe may, may never be able to do it. So that's the kind of mindset that this is creating out there. The other thing, the last hearing we had, Ms. Yuli, she was saying the lumber cost for a 3,000-square-foot house it's gone from $35,000 to $120,000. So when you combine these things, and then on top of that, rent in our area has gone up 44%. And then you look at the cost of money, uh, interest rates going up. Uh, it's pretty shocking how anybody in the middle class, uh, we all, people like to talk a lot about the middle class, but the pressure they're under is unbelievable, at least in our region. Every region's a little bit different. But a house going up 44%, Interest rates going from three and a half percent to six, six and a half percent. You get a half a house, you get a third of a house. That's the reality that we're dealing with. So we got all this uncertainty out there. And then the uh, Democrats are looking at the idea of raising taxes on small, medium sized businesses, primarily pass throughs. They're talking about a trillion to $1.3 trillion, they estimate anyway. And it's a lot of that's going to be picked up by the middle class, I mean by the uh, small, medium-sized businesses, which are pass-throughs, most of those dollars. And I can just tell you in the last couple of weeks, I've had a lot of uh, people that in small, medium-sized businesses are really concerned. They've, they've got a lot of uncertainty right now, but looking at the possibility of another tax increase, I don't think it's obviously it's bad policy, but it's also bad politics as we look down the road here a little bit. Uh, Mr. Pinto, I wanted to ask you in terms of uh, full expensing for small businesses, we'd like to see that made permanent. Uh, it's, as you know, that's depreciation. Normally it's written off over a period of five years, 20% a year. Uh, but the thought is I think full expenses made a huge difference to businesses in terms of not only whether you're buying or you're selling, either side it makes a big difference. Can you comment on that, well, making uh, full expensing permanent? Uh, yes, thank you, Congressman Buchanan. Uh, 
I've, I've been a small business, or I've owned a small business for many years, over the years, um, and having full expensing is an important part of making decisions on uh, those investments, and I certainly think uh, making that permanent would be uh, a positive uh, step. And then what's your thought on the supply chains? I mean, that's a big issue. What more could we do, or what's your thoughts? Do you have any ideas about how we can make that where it's more efficient because it obviously it seems broken. It's one of the reasons we've got these challenges, but it's not the biggest reason. I think it's the spending's the biggest reason, but what's your thought on, so, you know, in terms of these supply chains? I think uh, on the, you put your finger on it with the spending, I think the federal government has to cut back on uh, authorizing new spending um, so that the private sector can use the materials uh, that are in the supply chain and use them more effectively then the federal government, by throwing dollars at these problems, could possibly ever use. Uh, the federal government that doing that is going to distort things. Uh, there was mention earlier about uh, starting a um, rental tax credit uh, that was mentioned a few minutes ago. And the thought that came to my mind is as soon as you introduce that rental tax credit, um, that is going to get immediately capitalized into higher rents. And so you're going to end up raising rents rather than stabilizing them or helping uh, borrowers or yeah. helping and One other question, because my time's limited. Uh, in terms of the Fed's looking at raising uh, the interest rate of their 75 basis points, uh, tell everybody what that's going to do to mortgage costs and everything else. That's my mind's just a pass-through, and it, it's going to make it even more challenging, more difficult for anybody looking to try to buy a home or rent a home, really, or build anything. But what's your thoughts on the idea of raising interest rates again uh, and I'm just talking about the impact of it, uh, you know, that 75 basis points. So Sarasota, Northport, has the second highest house price appreciation in the country uh, after uh, Fort Myers. And the only way to get that back down, if you don't add more supply, is to tamp down the demand. And the Fed has generated this demand with these low interest rates. Uh, I think you need interest rates of around 6% in order to do that. Uh, the Fed is, uh, the rates are about 6%. I don't think they're going to go too much higher than that. The Fed is behind the curve, and the market is already anticipating what the Fed is doing. Um, and so I think we need interest rates of around 6% to get house price appreciation back to a level that people can at least have some income growth that uh, ties to house price growth. Ultimately, you need more supply. Thank, Thank you, you gentlemen. Back. Let me recognize the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Kildee, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and good morning, and thank you all again for, uh, for being here to the witnesses. Um, this is an important topic. It's one I've spent a good deal of my public career on, uh, working on housing affordability, community development. Um, as we've heard today, a lot of Americans face barriers to home ownership. A lot of communities lack the economic, educational opportunities that allow those communities to thrive and those families that live in them to have the full American experience. Uh, these are particularly difficult challenges in older industrial cities, uh, communities uh, like the ones I represent, Saginaw, Michigan, Bay City, Michigan, my hometown of Flint, Michigan. All have seen population loss, not due to their own uh, decisions, but due to macroeconomic decisions that they have no control over. I was the county treasurer in my home community of Genesee County, and I saw firsthand how vacant, delinquent, abandoned properties, tax delinquent properties can have a negative impact on communities. Housing is difficult enough without providing housing that is surrounded by distressed, abandoned properties. And that's why I um, started the Genesee County Land Bank in 2002 uh, to deal with those distressed properties. And part of, I think, what makes that model valuable, and this is what I want to address to Dr. Watkins, is that the land bank concept can be applied in virtually any market, all depending on what their needs might be that the market itself is not addressing. It can be uh, affordable housing. It could be green space. It can be um, dealing with blight, just straight up dealing with vacant, abandoned properties. Um, there are a lot of needs in communities, and these land banks have the opportunity, have the tools to, to help them. So Dr. Watkins, I wonder if you might just address the legislation that I know you're familiar with that Congressman Ferguson and I, Drew Ferguson, a member of this committee, have introduced um, to, to address land banks. And if you could specifically address two things. One, how land banks can deal with this question of housing affordability. 
And secondly, how a national network that shares best practices and gets that capacity into communities could be helpful in addressing the whole range of issues that these communities face. Thank you very much, Representative Kildee, for that question. Um, and let me just say I appreciate all the hard and visionary work you've done in this area of community revitalization. So um, I think a couple of things. Um, one, to Dan's larger point as to you know, how can a land bank um, actually help the supply side. Land banks are, are an amazing tool for municipal governments that need to free up um, a supply of potential housing and land. So land banks actually serve as a repository to hold uh, properties um, that simply stated nobody wants anymore. There's been a market failure. And for our older industrialized cities, we've talked about them today. They're the Columbus, Ohio's, the, the, you know, the Flint and Saginaw, Michigan's, um, Erie, Pennsylvania, we've spoke about. These are communities that have really good, solid people that want to stay, they want to build, they want to commit to their community. But, we do, but there has been some market failures. And so land banks become a repository to hold that land, but they also can um, distinguish back taxes and actually clear title, which, makes, which is the um, major sort of reason um, properties can enter into a pipeline to now be used for affordable housing. And so um, the Center for Community um, Progress has worked very closely with um, developers, uh, a lot with community land trusts, to actually move these properties into home ownership opportunities for our low income and middle income families. And so, and I want to also talk about um, the land, land banks and why they're so important, this Land Bank um, Network Act. We need a national um, network where land banks can share their best practices. So, for instance, in places like Ohio, we talked a lot about Ohio. Um, Ohio um, has done something really, really interesting, and they have moved um, hundreds of thousands of properties through this land bank process into home ownership. That creates more revenue for um, local government, and local government needs its revenue to do those necessary services for their residents. And so this National Land Bank um, Network Act will allow other communities across the country to learn about what's going on in places like Cuyahoga County what's going on in places like Flint, Michigan, what's going on in places like uh, Georgia, which we've seen, Georgia, um, we have more than 25 land banks across the state helping to repurpose these properties for affordable housing. So I'm really excited um, and hope that Congress's, Congress moves to pass the National Land Bank um, Network Act. Thank you uh, thank to the, the witnesses. Gentleman. I couldn't have said it better myself. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Arrington, to inquire. Chairman, thank you, and uh, witnesses, thanks for your testimony and your insights and knowledge, and it's very concerning for all of us uh, where we find ourselves in this affordability crisis um, that uh, is driven by record inflation for all Americans that's taking away now $500 on average every month for working Americans. I mean, there are probably five out of 10 Americans that don't have $500 a month in savings. And um, so we're, we're uh, on the front end. I hope we can turn it around, but I don't see the policies that will actually stop this inflation and recession and get us back on our feet and provide some relief to our fellow Americans. Uh, unfortunately, the nation is relearning two very important lessons, the law of supply and demand and the law of unintended consequences. When supply is constrained and is significantly outstripped by artificially, I would suggest, overstimulated demand and the gap between the two continue to grow, you get what we've gotten, which is the largest in recent history regressive tax on working families. The largest regressive tax in the form of inflation for working families. Um, and this is no exception in the housing sector. We've seen uh, the uh, interest rates now to, as a lever to try to get some control over inflation, uh, forcing 
mortgage rates now up by two points a year over year. If you own a house that cost you $300,000, you're paying on average $400 a month more in your mortgage every month. It's just unsustainable for most uh, working people in this great country. Um, I would suggest that the supply and demand gap uh, was self-inflicted in, 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 uh, in most of the case, okay? I'll never say every and all, but I think when you look at the labor shortages, you've got people that were given generous social welfare without work requirements and were paid more to stay home than to go back to work. Well, they had a rational decision. Make as much or more staying home or go back to work. And we have a massive labor shortage uh, situation in the country. Um, Overregulation, especially with the fuel supply. 80% of what turns the wheels in the United States economy is oil and gas, fossil fuels. It is, there is a whole of government assault on that industry, and we wonder why we are paying an all-time high uh, cost for fuel at the pump. These things are constraining supply. Meanwhile, as the Federal Reserve of San Francisco appropriately suggested, flooding the market with federal monies just overstimulated and created uh, this, this demand side crisis because of federal policies. Well intended, I don't think any of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle wanted the consequences, but we have reaped the whirlwind from those policies sown in the past. And here's the thing, they're continuing to push policies similar to what I described, namely the largest tax and spend bill we've seen in recent history. So Mr. Pinto, you talked about 70 years of government subsidies and interventionist policies in the housing sector for, a, for the objective of having more affordable housing stock for low-income folks. And, and you said, not only did we miss that mark by a country mile, we actually achieved the highest levels of foreclosures in our country in the developed world. So tell me what the effects of, the unintended consequences of more taxes, more regulations, the green book of the president, his tax proposals, four trillion. The skinny Build Back Better is a trillion dollars in taxes. What will those taxes, more regulations on oil and gas, and, uh, and, and, and more spending and dollars from our federal government going into the market do to this already tenuous, at best, situation in the housing market? Thank you for that question. I think the answer is it will cause uh, consumer inflation to go up, and we've talked about that. Um, on the house uh, price side, uh, it may actually result in a recession. A lot of people think we may be heading towards one, but I think in the housing area, we likely will have a soft landing nationally in terms of not having absolute house price declines. But if you start doing things that uh, lead to unemployment and lead to a stronger recession, that could then actually start impacting uh, home prices and have them decline over time, which is something we certainly uh, wouldn't want to see. Thank, Thank you, Mr. gentlemen. Chairman. Let me recognize a gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Boyle, to inquire. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, the last uh, two decades in the housing market has been really um, a unique period in American history. When you consider there was the recession of 2000, 2001, and then the September 11th attacks, the Fed, a Greenspan at the time, responded by dropping uh, interest rates to um, a very low level. That helped spur the real estate market, even as the stock market had already reached its, its peak and the bubble had burst. And suddenly, by the time you got to 2003, 2004, 2005, dramatic price appreciation. Uh, and suddenly, people feeling, uh, who had equity at least, feeling rich at least on paper. That combined with very loose lending standards, remember the no income, no asset loans, et cetera, helped fuel a record increase in asset prices, real estate asset prices. Eventually, the bubble burst, and those mortgage-backed securities and uh, mortgages with teaser rates 
couldn't be repaid. And we had, for the first time in American history, a decline on the real estate market lead the rest of the economy into a recession. That brings us to about 2008, 2009. In the years after that, we did not see real estate prices go up. The real estate market stayed rather flat for quite some time. So I'm curious how much of this relatively recent dramatic increase, both in the price of, of real estate uh, as well as rents, how much of that do you think can be attributed to catching up with, um, frankly, gains that should have happened but were paused for so long because of skittishness after the bubble burst in 08? Let me try to for answer you, that. Yeah. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you're absolutely right. House prices peaked in uh, 06, 07. They started to decline. That decline ended in 2011. Uh, they started going up again in 2012. As I mentioned earlier, uh, we noted at the Housing Center there was a house price boom restarting in 2013. We've been tracking that boom. Uh, house prices have been going up faster than incomes for quite some time, particularly at the low end. Um, that was driven largely by some uh, credit easing by the Fed earlier than the 2020 credit easing and also by some lending that FHA was doing. Uh, but then you had in 2020 and 21, the Fed put its foot on the accelerator with uh, easy lending um, and that really set um, the housing market on fire. But it was going up fairly rapidly, much more rapidly than incomes up to that point, particularly that's at the point. low end. That's Dr. Herbert, you I would say that, to your question, that there, there was a period of time where uh, housing prices fell along their long-term trend. So we, we had an enormous correction after 2008. By 2012, housing had been not, hadn't been more affordable than that in 30 years. If you look at the, yeah. the payment, the mortgage payment in real terms, it had fallen dramatically. Ed is right. Dr. Mr. Pino is right. Since 2012, house prices have gone up. But if you look at the implicit long-run rise in housing prices, what we'd expect, where housing prices gain a bit above incomes, which is what we've been doing in this country for a long time. Just in the last few years, we basically caught up to a long-run trend. Yeah. So the, the recent explosion has been taking us well above that trend. But yeah. before that, we were just catching up with that trend. Right. I also would like to talk Yes, please, Dr. Watkins. Yes. I would also like to uh, point out that there are multiple housing markets in this country. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Right? So there's not just one. And so we are seeing quite a lot of disparity across the housing market in the United States. So for instance, 477 housing markets, most of them are the small and medium-sized cities, have not caught up, even today, to their uh, pre-2008 numbers. So when you look at a city like Detroit, Detroit's um, average housing cost today is roughly around 66,000. Before 2008, it was roughly around 70. 77. So um, I, you know, I just want to just sort of um, yeah, caution great, us, yeah, so, that not everybody's experiencing. This so situation. this, in the time I, I have remains, just about 30 seconds. That's a perfect segue to bring it a little closer to my home. Uh, I live in Philadelphia. Actually, I think two of the three next speakers you'll hear from are fellow Philadelphians. Uh, we've been described by realtors I know as essentially always a Goldilocks market. We never get too hot. So we don't have the booms of Las Vegas or California or South Florida, but we don't tend to have the busts either. I was wondering if you could speak, peak, speak specifically about home affordability in, in my neck of the woods. Um, I invite my other panelists to, to talk through it. And also, I'm also willing to submit like a supplemental information. Oh, that'd that be could, great. Yeah, that could be um, to be helpful to you. I know we don't have that much time left yeah. and I don't wanna rush this very thoughtful uh, response. I appreciate that. Thank you. I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. LaHood, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, appreciate the witnesses being here today for your valuable testimony and insight. And obviously, we've heard a lot today about inflation. And uh, when we think about the, the genesis of the inflation crisis we're in right now, the bottom line is the federal government spent way too much money. We have pumped $7 trillion into the economy of taxpayer money over the last two and a half years. Now, much of that, when, we, when COVID hit and the pandemic hit, was necessary, uh, particularly for getting vaccines out and PPP loans. But I would argue at least the, the last $2 trillion and maybe more than that was unnecessary. And so we're in this crisis now of where we're at. And, you know, the Biden administration has essentially doubled down on, on this spending. And so, 
you know, we're in the situation where we're in and what affects everything in our society, supply chains, housing costs, um, you know, gas, groceries, everybody is affected by it. And so we look at the fact that now the Biden administration has created this 40-year high, uh, really crippling uh, consumer confidence and remitting damage uh, on U.S. supply chains. Uh, the situation, as I see it in my district and across the country, is really dire when we look at the U.S. housing market with millions of Americans struggling to buy, rent, and keep a home. Inflation has taken a toll on every aspect of the industry. Home prices are now up almost 30% since President Biden took office. Factor in mortgage rates doubling since January and prices for construction materials are up 20% since this time last year. So it's no wonder why a large fraction of low and middle income Americans are being priced out of the market. In my own district, which is central, west central Illinois, uh, kind of the heartland of America, uh, properties for sale are getting 15 to 18 offers in some cases, leaving many potential home buyers continually discouraged and exhausted. Um, I'll give you one example. Ed Neves, he's a longtime Bloomington Normal, which is uh, Twin Cities in my district, uh, real estate broker, and he's a home builder. He shared with me uh, this week that his brokerage company just sold a 1,400 square foot house that's newly built ranch home that would have been priced for 220,000 in 2019. Because of inflation and the high cost of nearly every component in building a new home, that ranch just sold for over $350,000 last week. When you look at the state of our housing market, supply is alarmingly low for the demand coming out of the pandemic. In the Bloomington Normal area in my district, which, is, uh, which has a working population of roughly 150,000 people, there would be uh, normally five to 600 houses on the market at any given time prior to the pandemic. Today, it's less than 60. And again, I go back to we've spent way too much money causing inflation. Um, Mr. Pinto, uh, I appreciated in your testimony here today uh, how you talk about and discuss some constructive solutions on how we address these problems. Uh, specifically, you remind us uh, of the Economics 101 lesson that more demand against a limited supply drives up prices. Uh, I'm afraid uh, some of my friends across the aisle are misguided in the types of solutions needed to address the current problems in the housing market. Can you expand on how the Democrats' agenda of increased government spending uh, can and will lead to fewer affordable housing options for low and middle income Americans, and particularly as we talk about potentially passing another Build Back Better or reconciliation bill that will cause more spending uh, that we've already had over the last two years? Thank you for that question. Uh, I think Build Back Better has about $185 billion uh, for housing, and uh, I think that would be highly inflationary. I think you'd have a situation very similar to what happened that I described from the 1968 bill when construction costs, believe it or not, you know, would go up even faster than they're going up now. Back then, construction costs went up 33 percent as a result of the 1968 Act. Congress had some very specific goals. Read Build Back Better. It says we're going to do, uh, you know, 500,000 of these or 1 million of those. Once you start setting those goals, they take on a life of their own. If there's not enough uh, material and not enough labor to uh, fulfill those requirements, but the government's spending the money, then it has to show up in higher prices. And that then crowds out the private sector, which can't do what it does, um, and because they're also suffering from higher prices. Thank you. Those are all my questions. I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Byer, to inquire. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And Mr. Chairman, thank you for scheduling this hearing. Uh, incredibly important. Uh, thank you for all our witnesses. I want to repeat what my friend, Mr. LaHood from Illinois, just said, that more demand and less supply drives inflation. Econ 101, I heartily agree. I want to come back to that again and again. Um, Ms. Hapernick, you, you say that the, the Affordable Housing Improvement Act, which was bipartisan, Del Benny, Walorski, Wenstrup, would expand access and credit, and is the most important thing we could do to, to help with housing. Mr. Pinto, on the other hand, says stop expanding the LITEC program, which has worked to reinforce racial discrimination. Um, that's worth an hour alone in terms of that probably the, the, the least important part of racial discrimination, but also crowding out the naturally affordable housing that could be built by the private sector. It seems to me that what LITEC does is expands supply and limits demand, moves demand out of the private sector. 
Wouldn't that have exactly the opposite effect on inflation? And, and is there such a thing as naturally affordable housing built by the private sector? Yeah. Um, naturally occurring affordable housing right now is um, not so occurring, right? But with the rents that have the rent increases that have been happening, we find less and less of naturally occurring affordable housing. But yes, we believe that um, building more and more affordable housing will help um, meet the demand that's in all levels of housing, especially affordable housing. Um, and we yes support the affordable zoning rental expansion of tax credits. Um, you know, it's the authority's been flat for 21 years, although we our demand has been growing and growing. So it, it seems like it's time to expand. Great. Thank you very much. And let me just reinforce that what LIHTC does is it expands supply and reduces demand. Um, Mr. Um, the, my, 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 Dr. Herbert, our, our ranking member's opening statement did five minutes blaming Joe Biden for the, for the inflation that we see. Um, and yet you point out so many interesting facts that led to this shortage of supply. The rapid house and a shortage of new housing supply that was years in the making, 1.4 million homes available at the start, just a three month supply, 2020 when Donald Trump was president. Um, the rental market, you had a vacancy rate that was the lowest since the early 1980s. Vacancy rates 2% below jump from 10 cities to 56 cities. Um, the sharp increase in people working and attending school from home. Um, the, the fact that new construction since 2010 hadn't kept up with household growth. Um, does any of this sound like the, the last couple of percentage of money put into the economy after all the bipartisan COVID bills and ARP that that was responsible for this rather than this long-term trend of underbuilding? Yes, it was absolutely, when we entered the pandemic, we were in a situation where we were only barely keeping up with demand. And so the spur of extra demand, which came from millennial generation who had been living at home for too long, moving out and because of the conditions imposed by the pandemic, drove a lot of that surge in demand. Did they have more to spend? Yes, because they weren't spending on travel, they weren't spending on food, they weren't spending on all these other things that you couldn't do during a pandemic. So the pandemic increased demand, pandemic increased spending, and it came up against this long-term shortage of supply to produce that spike in housing, which Mr. Pando himself pointed out, began in May of 2020. Let me also point out, as a humble but devoted member of Chairman Neal's Ways and Means Committee, and as the chairman of the Joint Economic Committee, someone needs to start poking holes in this idea that too much money chasing too few goods is what this is all about. If it was just too much money, then we, that, that American families wouldn't have three billion, no, three trillion with a T dollars more in their bank accounts than they did before the pandemic. They would be spending it all on this. And the people that are hurt most by it are the people that didn't get money from all the expansions. Let me just pivot one more second. Dr. Raymond, uh, thank you for all your work on the ISFR. I'm fascinated to find out that it was, it was created by the subprime crisis that arose during the George um, W. Bush presidency. And this was a reaction to people that didn't pick it up. But now that we understand that this has taken a really nasty turn, um, how do we get out of this? Thanks very much for your question. Um, I, you know, I think that we had a little bit of a hand in creating the secondary markets that support this industry and that I, I think that we need regulation of uh, the investments. I think that there's been times when the SEC has looked into uh, the, the appraisal practices of doing you know, drive-by appraisals uh, that these firms use to borrow against the value of these homes. I think there's been increasing work done understanding the co high concentrated um, market share in local areas that allow these firms to both borrow more heavily against homes that are being appraised higher and higher. Um, they're charging more rents um, and they're also uh, crowding out home ownership in this area. So I think those are important policies we could pursue. I think rental property registries are really important for understanding who owns homes. It shouldn't take a team of researchers with PhDs to put together who owns homes in a city. Uh, we need to understand who these landlords are, what their market share is, and also make it possible for cities um, and other groups to, to have a conversation with uh, landowners when there is a problem. Um, and I also think that uh, securing tenants' rights and making it more of an evil, even playing field. Uh, it's in, incredibly easy to file for eviction in Georgia, and the damage that this does to tenants' credit history 
um, the damage that it does to schools when we have exceedingly high eviction rates. We have neighborhoods in Georgia uh, that have close to a 50% eviction filing rate, and about 16% of all households are forced to leave their homes every single year. You can't run an elementary school under those conditions. It is too easy to kick people out of their homes given that that's a basic need, and we're damaging our next generation. And, the, and this is being used by Wall Street beyond what mom and pop landlords did. This le the legal rights um, are being used to jack up rents and um, to create further problems. So all Thank of those the gentleman. would help. Thank you. Uh, let me recognize the gentlelady from West Virginia, Ms. Miller, to inquire. Thank you, Chairman Neal. And thank you all for being here today. I'm from West Virginia. My state's a little bit different than many of yours. You know, Americans, they're paying more today for everything. Their gas, their food, their rents, their mortgages, their childcare, not to mention home repairs, construction. All of these prices are through the roof. Where I live, some people have to drive 30 to 45 minutes just to get to their job. Gasoline's expensive, you know? It's unaffordable and we have to stop what's going on. You know, it didn't really have to be this way. Since President Biden's first day in office, he's attacked American prosperity. He's implemented burdensome regulations and is now threatening even larger tax hikes on small businesses. 95% of the businesses in my state are small businesses. In my home state of West Virginia, we're seeing the dramatic effects and impact of the inflation, the gas price increases, and labor shortages. Few industries are feeling this pain more than what we do in West Virginia, particularly our home builders, who are running out of options to construct high-quality, affordable housing for my constituents. Sutter Roofing, which is a family-owned business based in West Virginia since 19. 02, told me that the cost of their materials has increased more in the last year than in the previous 12 years combined. Not only has the price increased, but it also takes time to acquire the materials and it's created such a strain on our supply chain, delaying projects and for some over a year. I know I personally ordered cabinets last December and they finally told me they'd be in in April, and this is the middle of July, and I haven't seen them myself. I have another constituent, John Jarrett, who owns a Jarrett Construction, and he gave me the heart-wrenching story of how today's crisis has ripped away 70 homes that were meant for senior citizens in the town of Institute, West Virginia. The cost per apartment for electrical work in a multifamily housing project is up 14%. 50% for plumbing and 36% for HVAC. You know, in, in addition to that, there's another project that's also at risk of being canceled in Logan, West Virginia, which was in the heart of coal country. And it'll cost 33 seniors the chance for quality, affordable housing. In May, we had a, a huge flood in the area that I live in, in, in Huntington and in that area. To see what happened, we had, there was over four inches of rain and people, it came up quick, it went down quick, but one family I know lost three cars. You drive down the street, all of their belongings were out by the curb. You're seeing all these signs even today that this house is being done by Sani, S-A-N-I, whatever the business is, where they're still cleaning up. When I was at the airport waiting to come, I ran into a friend whose house was above the floodplain, but she had nine feet of water in her basement. And she said, I lost my hot water tank, I lost my heating and air conditioning in this 90 degree weather. And of course, anybody that has a second refrigerator is usually in their basement. And so, so many people have had to deal with what they have to wait for just to get these things back. Mr. Pinto. What are the consequences for companies, contractors, and subcontractors, particularly those who are trying to build high quality affordable housing, when they have to pay these huge price increases and then wait an, an exorbitantly long time for the materials? Thank you for that question, Representative. Uh, certainly, uh, it slows down um, you know, the supply of housing. And as I keep saying, what we need is more supply. And I can also say that you talked about West Virginia. We did some research a little while back that showed that 
When it came to necessities like uh, spending on food, drugs, at discount stores, gasoline and utility spending, West Virginia was number one in the country in terms of percentage of that spending, 10 percentage points above the average of the country. So this inflation that is ravaging the country is hitting West Virginia particularly hard. So now the threat of increasing taxes on the small businesses, what are we going to do? How are don't we do it. Solve don't this? increase the taxes. Don't make it worse. I mean, it, it comes to that, the, the, you know, the saying, I'm from the government and I'm here to help you, that this is not going to help. Okay, thank you. I yield back my time. I thank the gentlelady. Let me recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Evans, who is with us remotely. Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to discuss the nation's housing crisis. I look forward to continuing this committee's work strengthening federal tax tools that bolster affordable housing development and preservation. As our economy rebounds from the pandemic, emerging housing assistance is dwindling and steeply rising costs of home ownership and rent. Coupled with a shortage of affordable housing have left my constituents reeling. A resident of Philadelphia Kensington neighborhood told me that he works 55 hours per week at a salary just high enough that he does not qualify for, for rental assistance. So he is facing homelessness and could lose visitation rights with his children. Another constituent, a veteran with a disability, is panicking about losing his home when his panic-related mortgage forbearing ends. A West Philadelphia mother of five is scrambling to secure an affordable, decent apartment while her landlord is facing a foreclosure on the current rental. And a senior shares that she is having trouble managing the stairs up to the third floor apartment, still working full-time, ineligible for subsidy housing, and struggling to find an affordable, accessible apartment that fits her modest budget. My constituents are countless other Americans who are crying out for help. Philadelphia is home to some of the uh, country's oldest housing stock. Many single family properties across Pennsylvania need critical repair. I'm proud that Pennsylvania will provide $125 million, led by a state senator to survive the home hold uh, repair program, modeled after Philadelphia's successful basic system repair program. This is a historical investment and will reinvest homes in neighborhoods ensuring that they are healthy and, and affordable. It is critical that we provide federal support to help American families remain safe in their homes as they age, which will also reduce abandonment and displacement. Dr. Watkins, how would the Neighborhood Home Investment Credit this committee advance, which will bolster the rehabilitation of home occupancy or vacant single homes that are otherwise too difficult or expensive to re rehabilitate, help revitalize the community and concentrate uh, poverty. Thank you so much, Representative. So the Neighborhood Homes Investment Act um, is created to help um, exactly the homeowners you're describing that live in communities that haven't experienced a huge equity bump, um, but they're still homeowners committed uh, to staying there, living there, and prospering there. And so um, what it does is that the Neighborhood Homes Investment Act will give developers um, a tax credit to um, be able to work on um, whatever sort of home improvement project that a home has or home needs. And these are the owner-occupied um, residents, right? Because they're all, also, the tax credit does allow for developers that actually want to develop and build home in areas where um, there is a huge equity gap. But for owner-occupied properties, um, what it allows is homeowners to then be able to go out and get developers um, who can, you know, upgrade, fix, uh, retrofit, whatever need that they have for their, um, for their housing. And developers will receive a tax credit for that. Once the work is complete, once the work is complete, they will receive it. Um, so that allows homeowners to be able to do those necessary um, updates to their homes with um, 
without sort of being penalized or not having the equity available to actually um, do those upgrades. So thank you for your question. Thank you. Dr. Raymond, how are institutional investors continuing the displacement of black residents in rising market urban neighborhoods? How do cash in hand investors drive home ownership further out of reach for minority families and first time home buyers? Thank you very much for your question. Um, institutional investors can outcompete uh, low and moderate income home buyers at every stage of the process. Uh, when you have a firm that's able to um, use algorithms and data technology to uh, come up with new listings every single day, they can be the first entity to make an offer. Um, they can, when they purchase all in cash, and um, because they're able to spread risk across their portfolio, and also because they have dedicated uh, repair teams, they can buy a home without um, doing an appraisal or offering inspection. Uh, that's not true of a, a home buyer who has, you know, FHA mortgage insurance, um, and that's not not true of most home buyers who have a mortgage. Um, and also, some of these firms um, are either buying from or pursuing very aggressive um, solicitation tactics. I mean, I'm sure we all have heard of that neighbor who gets called every day saying, hey, do you want to sell your home? Do you want to sell your home? And in Atlanta, we've done studies and found that often these firms are um, buying homes, uh, maybe even stripping equity from existing homeowners because they don't understand the true value of their home in today's market, um, and, and purchasing these even before they go on the market. So all of these factors combined with the fact that these firms um, focus in predominantly black neighborhoods and disproportionately uh, focus on communities in the Sun Belt uh, where black communities have established home ownership um, means that th this is creating a decline in home ownership opportunities for millennials and Gen X, um, Gen Z, um, and, and it's disproportionately affecting uh, communities of color. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize Thank the gentleman you. from Pennsylvania, Mr. Schmucker, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, th this uh, great discussion on this hearing. Uh, certainly, we all want to ensure that everyone can have a roof over their heads, can, can choose where they want to live and at a price that they can afford. I've come at this topic um, in my lifetime from a number of different perspectives. I was a contractor for several decades, um, saw the impact of uh, regulation, how that impacted prices. Then I was a township supervisor uh, where we implemented new zoning that allowed for mixed housing and higher density housing. I, I'm in um, Lancaster in York County, Pennsylvania. We value the farmland. We try to protect that, but that drives up uh, uh, land prices and, and the answer is higher density. And so work, worked on it from that perspective. Uh, and then worked on land banks in the state Senate. We implemented um, legislation that allowed communities to use them. And I authored a uh, historic tax credit to ensure that we were using existing stock. So I have a few comments I'd like to make today. I think, um, you know, there's a lot of, there's no silver bullet here. There's a lot of different solutions to solve this, but I think uh, Democrats today are understating the impact of inflation. And I've heard essentially uh, two things from them. One is they don't want to talk about inflation. Uh, and then secondly, when they do, it's blaming it on, on the, um, uh, on COVID. Uh, and in fact, they sort of derided Mr. Pinto, uh, heard giggles uh, from that side when he talked about what he thought was minimal impact of inflation, and Ms. Sanchez even said she hasn't laughed that hard in a long time. And so I actually pulled up a chart um, that I'll show you in a second here to see actually what happened with inflation during the pandemic. Uh, and this, we just took this off online. I had my, um, my staff print it out, and then I scribbled on it over there. This is essentially from the Brookings Institute showing the light blue is inflation, uh, CPI overall, and the dark blue is housing inflation, which would have been holding steady at around 2 to 3 percent until COVID hit, at which point it dropped. So the shelter CPI during COVID dropped for two years. You can see that between the, my two lines there. So I think Mr. Pinto could perhaps be right here that COVID itself didn't have the impact on inflation that we're talking about here. When did it go up? Immediately after President Biden took office and immediately after the AARP or the uh, ARPA was passed, the American Rescue Plan. Uh, and I think Ms. Sanchez maybe inadvertently said it exactly right. She said this was 
additional or uh, uh, um, less supply going, uh, going after with more dollars competing for that supply, which is exactly what we're saying caused inflation in the first place. Trillions of dollars inserted into the economy, which is exactly what Ms. Sanchez recognized, and caused the kind of inflation that we're seeing today. Now, why is this important? We could sit here and argue, and I'm not intending to do that, but it's very important that we evaluate the response to COVID uh, so that we don't repeat mistakes that have been made. And maybe the Democrats are saying that the administration got it exactly right. Uh, and in fact, we were derided just a little a bit ago by Mr. Pascrell about the economy after the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Well, I'll take our economy any time over what we're seeing now. And if you don't think that people, the American people believe they were better off then than now, uh, then you should be talking to your constituents. Because I know my constituents love the fact that they had $6,000 more in household income compared to now when they have less money available, and that's the impact of inflation. I had um, a realtor in my district said, I've seen firsthand the devastating impact that inflation has on buyers of new homes. In the past year, we've seen an average increase in the base pricing alone of $50,000. Combined with the rising interest rates, and this is the impact of inflation, Mr. Pinto said, we're going to have to get to 6%. Every time in history when we've tried to uh, control inflation, we've had to take interest rates above the rate of inflation. So we're going to see a lot of increases. That's going to make homes unaffordable to so many people. He says, combined with the rising interest rates, a new home purchaser can expect to pay an $800 or more monthly payment, uh, or uh, $800 more, which is pricing many buyers out of the market. So again, this is important as we talk about what is the next economic policy that this administration and Democrats are pushing, and they want to spend more money and raise taxes. It makes no sense. Look at the chart, decide for yourself whether it was COVID or whether it was the economic policies after COVID that had the impact that we've had. Maybe Democrats, as I said, are saying everything was done exactly right, but my theory here is that it wasn't COVID as much as it was how we responded to it. It's important that we get that right uh, going forward. So, Mr. Pinto, I don't know if you want to respond to any Can of that. we do that. it quickly, Mr. Pinto? Just to say thank you. <laughs> no, I didn't mean that quickly. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to finish your thought, Mr. Pinto? Uh, I just wanted to uh, amplify something on uh, the question by Representative Buchanan. Um, we would not have needed 6% interest rates at this point on mortgages if the Fed hadn't driven the rates down below 3% in the first place, which then ignited the house price inflation that really kicked in. We wouldn't be needing that. We could, if we'd had like 5% rates or throughout that period of 4.5% rates, we'd be in a much better position today than we are. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Schneider, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this meeting. I want to thank the witnesses for your patience and endurance in, in being here and, and giving us all the chance to ask questions uh, on what is clearly a very important subject. A uh, few things more important than housing. Uh, secure and stable housing make, can make the difference in a, a, a lifetime. It affects people's health. It affects people's outlook. It affects the future of their children. Um, it affects the ability to, through home ownership, create the wealth that then provides for a secure retirement. You can go on and on, and it's something that we really want to see available to, to all, all Americans. I've worked hard in, in my own community uh, supporting efforts to increase access to housing. Uh, for example, the E.B. Lee Project in, in Libertyville, Libertyville, Illinois, which would create affordable housing as a resource in the community, as well as a, what's in our community called PADS, PADS Lake County, to create fixed site housing for homeless individuals. Um, it's something that, that's important, and I think that's why it's so important that we, we have these types of hearings and continue to work to expand access to housing. Um, let me start uh, with uh, Ms. Hamernick, um, who let me also say thank you for your service uh, to Ida before moving out to Nevada. Um, and uh, earlier in the conversation today, my colleague argued that the federal government was, quote unquote, over subsidizing affordable housing. Counter to what we've heard, the low income housing credit is not a 90% credit. So my question for you as a current developer and from your past experience uh, with the Illinois Housing Finance Authority, 
Um, do developers have to prove that every dollar of credit you receive is necessary for financial feasibility of your projects? And why do credits, uh, why, why do you need credits compared to market rate housing uh, to offer affordable uh, rents uh, to tenants? No, thank you. Um, it really is because in affordable housing, we are charging rents that are below the normal market levels for the area. And HUD sets those limits for us. And there's no way we can make those market adjustments and make them artificially low without favorable financing. And so the credits come in to the deal as equity and not debt. So that's why it is just crucial for affordable housing to have tax credits. Um, some of the other gap financing that we use are um, traditional first mortgages, and sometimes uh, it could be home loans or um, other financing sources that have debt. But that primary capital coming in at approximately 75%, it's just key to making sure that we're able to keep below market in rent levels. Great. Thank you. Uh, let me turn to Dr. Herbert uh, for a moment. And I downloaded the State of the Nation's Housing Report. Um, I've skimmed it. I haven't completely finished reading all of it, but there's a lot of information here. And, and in your testimony, you, you talked, uh, you broke solutions down into two categories. I mean, this is basic economics, supply and demand. In the shortage of supply with rising demand, prices are going to go up. Uh, with rising demand, with the inability to meet the supply, prices are, are going to go up. If we want to bring prices down, make housing more affordable, we need to expand supply, as you said, and also provide demand-side programs. But I was hoping in the little bit of time left, you could expand a little bit that. Give me your top three ideas for expanding supply and your top three ideas for demand-side programs that will uh, in, uh, address our demand challenges. Uh, thank you, Representative, for the question. Uh, I think on the supply side, uh, we have had a lot of conversation today about the important role of the private sector. And I think one thing we can all agree on is that we, the private sector ought to provide as much housing as it can without government support. So what we need to do is do things that the government can do to help grease the skids. So we talked about local zoning and regulation and relaxing those constraints so the developers can build higher density housing. We need to do more to help expand the workforce so there's the labor that's needed. We can do more to uh, facilitate the adoption of, of uh, techniques of building such as modular housing and the like. Uh, Representative Schweiker from uh, Arizona was talking about what can we do? Well, we have the HUD code, which builds manufactured housing. We could expand the way the federal government provides regulatory relief. I think we should do all we can to expand the supply of market rate housing that is more affordable for people. But beyond that, there's a whole group of people in our country who simply can't afford housing even when the private sector is operating at its most optimal level. So for those folks, we need to add on the supply side because of all the reasons we've been talking about today, that there's simply not enough low-cost housing in the communities where we need it. And if we're just going to add demand-side subsidies, as Mr. Pinto has suggested, it could be inflationary. So we want to be careful that in places where supply is tight, we're not just adding demand-side, but we're adding supply-side. That's still going to leave a whole host of people who simply don't have enough money to pay for that housing. So we do need to have demand-side subsidies to make up the difference between what people can afford and what it costs to produce that housing so that they have enough left over for food and, and uh, health care and the like. So it's a combination of both balance, recognizing the market conditions that are needed to address those. And so in, in brief right. summary, in my last seconds, it's not either or, it's both and. And let me just put one plug. We need to get more people into the trades, uh, working at young people, Programs like Youth Build, there are things we can do to do that. So thank the gentleman. Let me comments. recognize the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Hearn, to inquire. Mr. Chairman, thank you so much for having this very important hearing on housing affordability. As we know, it's been debated and talked about a lot today about inflation, 41-year high. It's uh, been going up every month with my friends across the aisle and the administration have said it's going to go down or flatten and every month it's gone up it will be higher next month as well. The average price of a home sold in the second quarter of 2020 for 374500 This is the average. Um, this wouldn't even buy you a garage here, I don't think. But in the first quarter of 22, the average sales price was 507800 so a 35% increase in two short years. If those numbers don't scare you this well, this spike exceeds the steep climb in home prices that we saw in the 2008 market crash that so much has been talked about. The situation we're seeing today is the preamble of what some would argue is we see another bubble coming as well, a dark financial period of time for the American people coming up. Uh, we've talked a lot about today in the hearing and many hearings about Treasury's late move to raise interest rates 
Uh, Mr. Pinto, you talked about why we're rates that low to begin with. Uh, so we're having this, everybody is talking about us going to recession except for the people that are actually in charge of putting us into a recession. Uh, the bad monetary policy and the reckless government spending have put us on this path. You, you saw my colleague from Pennsylvania's chart. Uh, Brookings isn't a bastion of conservatism and it's just the numbers. I mean, they're easily to be fact checks. We're not going to easily reverse this trend. Um, we could talk about, we all, we've talked about why the supply chain is bottled up. Uh, we might argue why the demand is so high all of a sudden for housing. Um, too, much, too much money chasing too few things, which is a, a layman's definition of inflation. Um, again, we've had hearings in here and we've shared with the witnesses about this being the greatest economy ever and do you agree or disagree? And the witnesses for the Democrat Party have denied that, only to find out that President Biden is the one that said that about the economy. So it's, nobody back homes in our district believes this. Uh, they don't believe 9% because they're experiencing 20% increase. When you look at, or 20% inflation, when you look at the things that they spend their everyday monies on, energy for their home, fuel for the car, and food for themselves. Money is running out. And we have got to get this inflation under control and the policies we're having right now and debating in Congress are not gonna be what stops that. Prior to coming to Congress three and a half years ago, I spent nine years as a real estate developer and a home builder. And I can tell you, I've had people call me from across my district and across the state concerned about what's happened. Building costs are up 19% year over year. Delivery costs are sharply increased due to rising fuel costs. Can't get people, uh, it's devastating can't make their profits, well, they quit building homes, so they cut inventory, which drove up pricing. Um, right now, we're seeing the interest rate go. We saw 60,000 home purchase agreements were canceled in just last month, equal to almost 15% of the homes that went under contract. That's the highest cancellation rate since the start of the pandemic. Mr. Pinto, thank you for joining us today. I have a few questions. Um, is a recession coming? We'll try to keep these very short if we can. I think there'll be a recession in the, in the technical definition, which is two uh, consecutive quarters with uh, declining GDP. Uh, it could happen these, the last quarter and this quarter we're in. It more likely will happen next year. I don't think there's going to be a house price deflation, as I mentioned earlier, this year or next. So do you, um, how do you see that impacting the housing market? It's going to help it, hurt it? Um, I think is, if it's a relatively minor recession and, and any recession has impact, uh, I think uh, it will not have a large impact on the housing market in terms of creating foreclosures and things like happened last time. Uh, on the other hand, if that recession gets more severe due to making additional bad policy mistakes, then it could impact the housing market much more severely. Does the government regulation of the housing market distort the market? and make it harder to create affordable housing? Absolutely. How, how so? Uh, the, the government, if, and you can see it from all of the acts, I, I put a list of 40 acts that uh, Cong this Congress has passed over the last 70 or 80 years. Uh, there are many more that could be added to that list. Um, the financing, 80% of the financing in the United States is provided by the federal government, guaranteed by the federal government for single family. Uh, the federal government basically is involved completely and totally in the housing market from one end to the other. And so whatever problems we're having is due to two things. One, the uh, intervention of the federal government, and two, the legacy of that zoning that I talked about from 1921, where the federal government said, uh, exclude everything but single family detached, and for the purpose of keeping blacks and ethnic minorities uh, out of uh, those neighborhoods. That's where both of the problems we have today come back to the federal government. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize a gentleman from California, Mr. Panetta, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate this opportunity, and thank you for having a hearing on such an important topic. I got to admit, uh, I've learned a lot uh, by listening not just to the witnesses, but I have to admit also my, uh, my colleagues on the committee in realizing that uh, affordable housing is not just an issue in my district on the Central Coast, but pretty much throughout the country. Um, obviously, uh, we've talked a lot about relaxing zoning requirements, which obviously will encourage the building of new market rate housing, mostly at higher price points, and subsidizing the construction of housing reserved for lower income tenants. 
However, we still got to address the missing middle or the lack of housing for middle class families. Uh, this is, you know, housing for uh, the people who are teaching our kids, who are keeping our streets safe, law enforcement, our service workers, and more who we want to be able to live where they work. What we've seen, especially in California, is that there are people who work in our communities, but they're driving hours to get to our communities and not being a part of our community and therefore not spending time with their family or spending time in our communities when they're not working. And so for many of these people, they can't afford newer housing and they aren't eligible for low income units. So Ms. Uh, Hammernick, let me uh, address my first question to you. What can we do to address the quote unquote missing middle and increase workforce rental housing for the middle class in addition to housing for low income families? Yeah, um, it's, 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 a, it's an important issue that you raise. Um, a, a couple things. One, I think that um, we at Nevada Hand, we're really trying to work with the local business communities to find out exactly what income levels they're needing and where they're falling in that AMI level. Um, with the single family prices um, escalating so much, right? The, the down payment assistance programs can only do so much and they're really having to stack to get anywhere near where they would have to be to help folks get that down payment assistance um, done. I, I will mention this. Um, in 2019, we did an internal study and 10% of the people leaving, families, just families, leaving Nevada Hand, um, our uh, LIHTC buildings, 10% of those were leaving to buy their first home. So I think that we're able to help people in rental housing take that next step when it's affordable into home ownership, sometimes naturally, and then sometimes with a lot of down payment boost. Yeah. Let, let, let me just continue on that, on the down payment. Um, I was able to uh, introduce this year with another colleague on the Ways and Means Committee, a First Time Home Buyers Act, which would provide a tax credit of up to $15,000 to qualified first time home buyers based on both the area medium income and area median purchase prices. Uh, 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 Dr. Hammernick, I mean, is that the type of incentive that uh, would obviously help? That would absolutely help, right? Especially if that could stack with other down payment assistance programs, yes. Um, I, I, do, I do share some of the other witnesses' concerns about long-term um, stability and, and responsibility of home ownership. So I would, I would suggest that there's a strong home buyer um, ownership counseling component that goes along with that. So people really understand what they're getting into once they get um, own, ownership of the home. Great, thank you. And then Dr. Herbert, on, on that note, you mentioned that um, obviously to make it easier for low income families and people of color, we need to close the affordability gaps, including for down payments. Could a first time home buyer uh, credit or, down, other, or other down payment assistance, if properly targeted, help close that gap? Absolutely. The, down, the lack of savings is the principal barrier that most low and moderate income people face in qualifying for a home. We can tweak the mortgage interest rate, but that won't move the needle as much as it will to give people down payment assistance. And I would just say, too, in thinking about targeting it, um, it's important to think about how do we make this available, particularly to people of color, where the homeownership gaps are most significant. And as we look at people of color, the biggest gaps are actually those making 80 to 100 percent of AMI and 100 to 125 percent of AMI. So when we're talking about down payment assistance to close racial home ownership gaps, we don't want to target them too tightly, but we do want to do things like first generation or the like to make sure that these are closing gaps. Great. Thank you. And I'm running out of time. Mr. Chairman, I yield back and thank you again for having this hearing. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Kustoff, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for convening today's hearing. Thank you to the witnesses also. And a lot of um, a lot of discussion about inflation. I, I don't think there could be any argument that if the federal government prints and flushes into the economy 1.9 trillion dollars in new money, that it can't do anything but cause an inflationary effect. But Mr. Pino, to, to you, in my district, I represent West Tennessee, the eighth congressional district. In the first 16 months of President Trump. The year-over-year -year increase, uh, first 16 months in housing, was 5.3 percent. In the comparative time period of, of President Biden, it's almost 23 percent. Now, I was talking to two home builders, 
in the, uh, in the West Tennessee, specifically the Memphis area, David McLemore and Bob Turner. And aside from the inflation, they were citing decisions made by this administration that have increased their cost to build. Specifically, they were talking about um, building a, a 3,200 square foot home, the HVAC cost. In the last 30 days, because of President Biden's environmental policies, have increased from $14,000 to $21,000 in 30 days. So aside from all the discussion about inflation, are there other administrative decisions that have been made over the last 16 months that you can think of that have contributed to the high cost of new home construction? Well, Representative, I think you put your finger on one with the uh, HVAC. Um, I read about that and um, the proposal uh, would be to mandate a very expensive addition uh, to the uh, HVAC process that has to get rolled into house prices and uh, that will uh, uh, lead to higher prices and then ultimately less supply. Um, the, uh, uh, I know there's some, uh, uh, years ago, four or five years ago, I was driving up to uh, uh, Quebec and I saw lumber trucks going in both directions and I know there's a difficult time now getting lumber from, uh, from uh, Canada and that's probably another area that uh, getting rid of that uh, tariff I know it's supposed to go down next month, but it could go down even further. We need, we need more lumber to keep the prices uh, lower. Thank you, Mr. Pinot. Going back to the inflation numbers, and, and obviously the report that came out this morning was far worse than the economists predicted, the pundits predicted. They were all talking about a CPI number of, eight, I think, 8.8 percent. Of course, it was 9.1 percent. On the, on the rents, I think when you extrapolate that, uh, according to the data I saw, that uh, rents rose 0.8 percent. That's the biggest monthly increase since 1986, so uh, 36 years. So there's a lot of talk about what the Federal Reserve may or may not do. There, there's some speculation now that the Federal Reserve may raise uh, the cost of borrowing 75 basis points this month and maybe another 75 basis points in September. Um, what what does that do to the to the consumer, and, and how does that uh, does it does it incentivize? Does it disincentivize, or how would you characterize it? Well, I, I think you have to uh, look at how the capital markets work. They work in advance. They're taking their cue from the Fed. The Fed has been very slow to raise interest rates, and as the Fed started talking more seriously about inflation not being transitory, and uh, they since now their number one job to fight inflation, the capital markets, the debt markets have been anticipating higher rates. So the Fed is playing catch up. If you think about it, mortgage rates have gone from below 3% to around about 6%. The Fed hasn't raised three percentage points. Um, they're still way back with just a couple of increases. And so they need to have those increases, but I, as I said, I don't think the mortgage rate is gonna go up that much more. The um, Treasury rates will go up, uh, the, lo the low end, but the uh, mortgage rate, I don't think will go up much above 6%. It could go to six and a quarter, but I don't think it's gonna go to seven or eight. Of course, if it goes to six and six and a quarter, that adds four to five to six to $800 more per month in a mortgage payment than somebody would have made at a, at a mortgage loan of 3%. And, and that, that adds up to real money when you, when you multiply that by 12 months. Well, that, that's true, but we can't continue to have house prices right. going up at the breakneck level they've been doing. We One, have to get that under control. We have two inflation problems. We have a housing inflation problem, which is somewhat independent of the consumer price inflation problem. The Fed left, left, left let both of them get tremendously out of control. They're getting more under control on the housing side. We see some progress there, but they've made no progress yet on the consumer price side. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Gomez, to inquire. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I represent um, the city of Los Angeles, central LA, and the east side of LA, and it provides a, a snapshot of the housing crisis, where housing costs far outpace wages and working families live one financial crisis away from losing their home. And then we see gentrification and market pressures threatening to push out the vibrant black, Asian, and Latino communities that have lived there for generations. 
The housing crisis isn't just a big state or a blue state issue. Americans everywhere are struggling. That's why I'm introducing legislation to help renters stay housed. On Monday, Congressman Richie Torres and I introduced the Stable Families Act to protect our nation's most vulnerable tenants from the destabilizing effects of eviction. This legislation establishes a permanent national housing stabilization fund to provide housing stability services and emergency financial assistance to tenants experiencing a financial crisis. Today, I'm introducing, uh, reintroducing the Rent Relief Act alongside Congressman Danny Davis. Our legislation creates a monthly refundable tax credit similar to the Advanceable Child Tax Credit to help low-income families afford the cost of living. And also, I introduced a Neighborhood Investment Act to help transition underutilized office and commercial space to affordable housing. But today, I want to take a look at um, a particular phenomenon in the housing market that is disadvantaging potential home buyers and renters. In recent years, large-scale institutional investors have rapidly expanded into the single-family rental business. Institutional investment firms have an unfair advantage over individual mortgage buyers who are shopping with a mortgage. They make cash offers bankrolled by hedge funds, pension funds, and ultra-wealthy individuals. Dr. Raymond, does the growing presence of large institutional investors in the single family rental market cut out first time and moderate income buyers? Absolutely, these firms outcompete uh, low income first time and moderate income buyers uh, and they particularly buy in that price tier as well. And there's been multiple studies that show that uh, where these firms purchase, the home ownership rate is lower locally. And does it have a warping effect on the price of housing in those areas? I have seen studies that show that it has a warping effect on rents in those areas. Um, I want to, I think we need further research, but I suspect that it does. Um, Dr. Raymond, how does the financialization of the single family rental rentals exasperating housing affordability and wealth, uh, wealth inequality, and who is most impacted? The, we've always had single family rentals in this country, but what's new is that we have single family rentals that are large corporations tied to secondary financial markets, and these create intense pressures to extract as much rent as possible, um, to generate profit, and to minimize costs, and, and this is uh, really difficult to bear for um, low-income communities, and also in part because this emerged in the footprint of predatory subprime lending of the foreclosure crisis, um, and in part because these firms have a certain buy box where they uh, prioritize homes that are, tend to be found in, uh, in moderate income communities of color, they're, they're really focusing on these communities. And so if they were great landlords, I wouldn't be here, but they're not. They have high eviction rates, they have poor maintenance, and they crowd out home ownership, and it's being visited primarily on communities of color. Uh, and I read your testimony, and I read some reports that said that between March of 2020 and through January of 2022, corporate landlords had filed 168,000 evictions, and at least 70,000 of those uh, evictions occurred when the federal eviction moratorium was still in effect. Um, I believe that it is shameful. Um, and one of the things my office was doing was also trying to educate my constituents about their rights when it comes to being, uh, to staying in a property, not being evicted, um, and making sure that they are not uh, preyed upon by oftentimes corporate landlords that have more access to uh, higher paid attorneys. Um, this is an issue that is not gonna go away. I've seen this issue um, start rising in the, I guess the public consciousness more and more outside of Los Angeles. For Los Angeles and California, this is, this is something that we've been dealing with. And the rise in costs has been going on, uh, and housing costs has been, it's nothing new. Um, but now it's starting to spread to red states. I was in Salt Lake City, I saw uh, uh, individuals living in tents. I was in uh, Ohio, you're starting to see the same thing. So this is not a blue state, big city issue. This is an issue and a crisis that is impacting every corner of our, of our population and every corner of our country. With that, I would like to uh, yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Higgins, to inquire. Thank you, uh, Chairman Neal, and thank you for holding this uh, important hearing. Uh, the economic circumstances of housing affordability uh, were present long before COVID-19 pandemic began. 
and are now even more difficult. Low housing supply has made it a challenge to purchase a home. My Western New York district has a traditionally stable housing market that has become increasingly more competitive. For people of color, uh, the path to home ownership is worsened by decades of discriminatory policies. Buffalo's east side tells a story of the current housing market. As you all know, the neighborhood was recently targeted by a racist mass shooter in part because of the reality of these structural inequalities. Decades of redlining and systemic disinvestment have produced vacant, dilapidated homes where there could be affordable single-family housing. Gentrification and displacement are also concerns. As medical research and tech companies grow their presence in Buffalo, Eastside residents rightly worry that rents and home values will increase to a point where they are no longer affordable. Uh, the right policies have the ability to address these concerns while promoting equitable investment. Our bill, the Neighborhood Homes Investment Act, would provide a tool to encourage the construction of moderately priced single-family homes in neighborhoods of need. The bill would create a tax credit to rehabilitate dilapidated single-family homes or build new homes on empty lots. Dr. Watkins, uh, can you discuss the Neighborhood Home Investment Act and the opportunities that would be provided for pathways to home ownership uh, for people of color. Absolutely, thank you so much, Congressman, for that question. Um, I would like to also point out that um, the land bank that services your area has about 8,000 vacant properties in its inventory. So there's a lot of opportunity to help create affordable housing um, with the, the actual literal um, inventory that's available today. Part of the uh, challenge has been how do we, A, renova uh, renovate these um, homes um, so that when families acquire them, they can be turnkey. We don't need families, especially low and moderate income families, absorbing new debt. And two, what's the mortgage product um, that will help these families be able to purchase these properties from the land bank? Even if the transactional costs are as low as 25 or 30,000, we have spent the bulk of this morning talking about the lack of down payment assistance. We need a mortgage mechanism for families to be able to purchase these 8,000 vacant properties so they can put them back into productive use. How the Neighborhood Homes Investment Act would work is that it would allow developers to be able to do the renovations on these, on these vacant properties. These are the non-occupied uh, properties that families um, can utilize as natural affordable housing in, in their area. And so what happens with the Neighborhood Homes Investment Act is that um, developers would be giving a, given a tax credit once the home is sold and acquired by a potential homeowner. And we think this is a, um, a great strategy to A, increase home ownership in places like Buffalo, um, two, it actually moves those problem properties out of the land bank um, and, and move them in directly into the hands of potential homeowners. It creates um, more revenue for local government, and it actually uh, combines public-private investment. So we do urge Congress to pass the Neighborhood Homes Investment Act. We think this is a strong strategy to free up and to develop and bring the, um, some of the current um, supply, bring it up so it could be um, available to current homeowners as a potential home ownership opportunity. Thank you for your question. Yeah, thank you, Doctor, for your leadership on this issue and uh, can underscore the importance, particularly in over, older areas. Uh, the historic tax credit, new market tax credits have been profoundly uh, successful in helping to rebuild places like Buffalo, New York and other cities throughout the country. So this is a new tool uh, that we could enact uh, toward the goal of stabilizing neighborhoods. And as you said, 8,000 properties that are land banked um, would be you know, a, a huge, huge uh, boost uh, to the stability of this part of the city of Buffalo. So I thank you for your leadership. With and that, I'll yield back, sir. Oh, um, and it will also help to increase the home ownership, not just of low income, but of your African American and Latino residents, which we think is one of the major um, important parts to this bill. Thank you very much. Thank the gentleman. Uh, Mr. Horsford helped to inspire this meeting, asked for it, and helped to develop the witnesses. The gentleman from Nevada is recognized to inquire. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, uh, for calling this critically important hearing today. 
I also do want to thank all of our witnesses, and especially uh, Audra uh, Hammernick uh, from Nevada Hand for all the great work uh, that you and your team do to provide uh, roofs uh, for many of my constituents every single day. Unfortunately, the problem that we face today is too great for housing advocates like yourself to confront alone. Rental rates in Las Vegas have increased by almost 30% in the last year. And if that's not shocking enough, they are increasing at a time when our local economy has still not recovered for everyone equitably. The hospitality industry, the main driver of our economy, is still not at pre-pandemic levels. Seven out of 10 of the most common jobs in Las Vegas do not pay enough to rent a studio apartment. 70% of hospitality workers, culinary workers, bartenders, and servers cannot even rent a place of their own, let alone achieve the American dream of home ownership. Workers like my constituent Linda, a single mother of three, who lost everything in an unexpected and devastating fire. Her family had been living in their rental home for nearly a decade and paid $1,650 a month in rent. Now, through no fault of her own, they can barely find a place to live at any price. Linda and my constituents deserve better. But unfortunately, we have out-of-state corporate investors who have been outbidding Nevadans everywhere they look. The share of 2021 home purchases by investors in select zip codes in my district range from 2% in one zip code to 26% of the homes owned by these out-of-state corporate investors. And this zip code, 89032 and 89031, is the community that I grew up in. It's a predominantly black and Latino and immigrant zip code, and it is represented by a large percent of single moms who are raising their kids. This graph shows the instance of the share of the purchased homes bought by these investors. The darker the color, the worse the impact. And it's predominantly in North Las Vegas. I represent a very diverse district, but you see in the suburbs, they didn't go by those communities. They came and targeted communities of color. And instead, homes all across my district are being taken off the market to pad the pockets of wealthy hedge funds. This is alarming on its own, but the recent reports that institutional investors have targeted these neighborhoods of color and have also targeted them during eviction processes over the, this period is also very alarming. My constituents won't stand for it and I won't either. That's why today I'm introducing the Housing Oversight and Mitigating Exploitation Act, also called the HOME Act, to fight back. We must empower HUD to investigate just how these investors have been impacting communities of color and to ensure that we have a level playing field in the housing market. The HOME Act will make sure that the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development can monitor unfair competitive practices, support market transparency, and determine whether these investors are engaging in anti-competitive behaviors. And if they are, they will be fined and those funds will be deposited into the National Housing Trust Fund so that we can continue to develop more affordable housing. Now, the HOME Act will be a great start to bring prices down now, but we need to look forward to solutions that will keep people housed for years to come. Ms. Hammernick, would you be able to highlight how necessary it is that Nevada Hand can leverage federal investments like the Low Income Housing Tax Credit to incentivize construction and discuss the ways in which formula funding for federal rental assistance um, actually holds back communities like Las Vegas that are high growth? Yeah, you know, the federal funding for 
housing choice vouchers that go to the housing authorities is really based on what they received last year. And for high growth areas um, like Nevada, um, uh, we, Phoenix is some, some a city near us that's having similar issues. Um, our growth has outpaced by far the number of vouchers that we receive. And when you look at the numbers, it's, it's absolutely crazy. So uh, we have homeless issues in Las Vegas. Uh, if we had more vouchers, we could do permanent supportive housing that uh, use project-based vouchers. We had Congressman Chu talk about this a few minutes ago. Um, so the voucher issue is a really big deal. And it's it, we talk about using uh, vouchers in the normal marketplace to help people and families be stabilized. Um, we're really missing the mark in high growth areas in the country with this formula the way it is right now. Thank and you. then for your other question regarding LIHTC, of course, we need, we need LIHTC to be able to build the multifamily um, affordable rentals. I appreciate Thank the gentleman. Your leadership, Chairman. Let me recognize the gentlelady from the Virgin Islands, Ms. Plaskett, to inquire. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, for your leadership in bringing this hearing about. I think this is such an incredibly important topic. Um, we've all learned so much from the witnesses that are here, had a chance to um, really dig into the subject. So I thank Mr. Horsford for bringing this topic up and Mr. Chairman for your willingness to take this on. So interesting, I was just uh, showing my colleague earlier today an article that I was reading in the Wall Street Journal that reads, end of tax incentives threaten New York rentals. So this is something that's a, an issue that's keen not just at the federal level, but also at the state level with um, the shortage of rental homes. You know, I have grown up in some very diverse communities here in the United States. Um, when I grew up uh, as a young child in Brooklyn, in the Bushwick and Williamsburg area, it was an immigrant population, predominantly, uh, you know, a mix of West Indian, Caribbean people, uh, Puerto Rican families, um, Italian families, Hasidic Jews. Uh, I went back a month ago and I was, I didn't know where I was. I was in a completely different place with the amount of warehouses and lofts that are now being uh, occupied by young people who make double and triple the salaries that we make as members of Congress and have pushed out uh, individuals like my mother who would walk, you know, walk down the streets on Saturday mornings pushing her grocery cart and stopping at different stores where she would get her, you know, the butcher shop, this. And, and I know that's not America as it is anymore, but the notion of working families not being able to live into communities is a loss, I think, not just for those individuals, but for the others to be able to experience what I believe makes America so great. You know, uh, Mr. Chairman, when we did work on the Neighborhood Homes Investment Credit portion that was a piece of Build Back Better Act, I thought that that was incredibly hopeful to the, for the ability for us, as I know my other colleague, Mr. Dwight Evans has been working so hard to maintain middle-class neighborhoods, to maintain working neighborhoods throughout this country, and to create affordable home ownership in lower income areas, to allow those individuals, as Dr. Watkins was talking about, to be able to uh, rebuild, to renovate those places, and to be able to own them. Um, Dr. Herbert, I didn't know if you had any thoughts as well about the Neighborhood Home Investment Credit, uh, if you wanted to share with us about some of the trade-offs the policymakers should consider as we potentially can consider this as a standalone piece. Uh, thank you, Representative. You know, I, I think uh, as Dr. Watkins' uh, written testimony describes, these communities have suffered from a cycle of disinvestment that is self-reinforcing. These are also primarily communities of color, places where people would like to be able to make a home and stay and become homeowners. But without that supply of housing that is good quality and decent, and without a future for those communities that looks to be bright and to be a good place to invest, those investments don't happen. They're not possible to happen, they don't happen. So the neighborhood home investment credit would provide the capital needed to close that gap between what it costs to build housing and what it 
his worth in the market, to jumpstart, to prime the pump, to change the cycle of disinvestment in these communities and to create more vibrant communities. It's an absolute uh, case where government intervention is necessary because the market forces by themselves won't turn that around. Thank and you. You know, that's not unusual for this country for the government to step in to try and spur investment, to spur economic development. We do it in trade, we do it in businesses, and we've done it in home ownerships in the past. Whether it was supporting GIs uh, to change their mortgage rates, to allow them to be able to not default, to not go into foreclosure, as well as some um, nefarious practices that we've had with redlining with other. In the little bit of time that I have left, I didn't know if any of the witnesses wanted to talk about affordable workforce housing, which is something that I know in the Virgin Islands we're keenly feeling as we're attempting to rebuild after the 2017 storms, but cannot find affordable workforce housing for individuals to come and support that rebuild. Um, you know, I think we've been talking a lot about today about missing middle housing and that the, the fact that the housing market, what it's, it doesn't produce housing at the lowest end for people who are too, too, have incomes too low to afford housing, but we need more housing in the middle that people who are making a decent living but the market still can't provide it. I think there's ways in which uh, clearing the path for deregulation and doing other things to be able to make it more possible for the private sector to do it, but it's also likely that we'll probably need some subsidies. You know, in many respects, the low-income housing tax credit is a, is a workforce housing credit for helping people up to 80% of AMI, so absolutely. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chairman. I believe my time has expired. Thank the gentlelady. Also, let me thank our witnesses uh, for joining in the discussion today, and it really turned out to be a discussion. Please be advised that members have two weeks to submit written questions to be answered later in writing. Those questions and your answers will be made part of the formal hearing record. With that, the Ways and Means Committee stands adjourned.